Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the track and then we'll get right on to our first speaker. So to start out, we're going to have two 20 minute introductory talks and then a 10 minute Q&A following that. And then we'll proceed directly to our first panel. So that's our format to start with. So we've subtitled uh, this section, Machinations of Light. This year, the the theme this year on the art and design track revolves around the concept of livingness. Our plenary speaker, Marietta Ramdaska, spoke about biophilosophizing and bioart as moving towards ecologies of non living, where the boundaries between life and non life, emergence and decay, active and passive vitalism are blurred. She led us on a discussion of whose life mattered and therefore which entities' deaths are worth recognizing and mourning. The word machination is kind of a cool word. It means a plot or a scheme, intrigues, conspiracies, designs, devices, stratagems, and contrivances. In the context of this biosomic track, I'm also appropriating the term to refer to the making of a cellular type machine that can output product and support processes of life. So that's, that's fairly ambiguous. Uh, and with that, I wanna move towards introducing Georg Tremel. He will be our first speaker. He's from the Bio Club Tokyo, and he's a well-known member. You guys all know him from the Bio Summit. Uh, Georg's an Austrian artist living and working in Tokyo. He studied biology, informatics, and media art with Peter Weibel and Karen Dusvistek in Vienna and continued his studies at the Royal College of Art in London with Anthony Dune and Fiona Rabi. Since 2001, in turn, in, intertwining biological, cultural, ethical, and society codes, creating objects, installations, and situations for contestable discussion uh, with Shaiho Fukuhara. He co-founded BCL, an artistic research framework for critically exploring art and biotech. BCL's body of works include Biopresence, the Common Flower series, and Ghost in the Cell. Gerg's currently a PhD candidate in artistic research at the University of Applied Art in Vienna, and he's also a visiting researcher with Metaphors with Hideo Iwasaki. And Gerg's also the co-founder of BioClub Tokyo, the first open biolab in biohacker space. Gerg's going to give a title, a, a talk titled Identities, Copyrights, and Living Materials. Welcome, Georg. Thanks for, thanks for starting us off here. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Calamara, for the nice uh, introduction. So I will share my screen now. And here we go. And uh, yeah, I think you can see it, right? Yes, very nice. Yeah. Okay, so, so the title is Identities, Copyrights, and Living Materials, but of course, I only realized later that Yona is going to follow my talk, and I, I think the, sh the title should have been um, Semi-Living Materials, so in, so in reference to, to Yona, I would like to change it officially to Semi-Living Materials. So, uh, Caroline, thank you for, for, your introduction, for introducing me. It's, it's always a good idea to give people some sort of background or sort of some sort of keyword so they know uh, where I'm from or where I've been, and maybe we can find some, some commonalities. But I think you mentioned most of them, maybe most important is the, the Metaphorist Research Group we're gonna hear later from Hideo Iwasaki and his uh, 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 artificial memorial. I will also talk a little bit about it. Okay, so uh, what I would like to talk today is about these this, uh, three questions. So can, can cells outside the body or tissue culture cells have identities and agencies? So what kind of legal status does this semi-living neo-matter have? And can this living matter actually claim copyright of their actions? So I would like to, um, to, to, to go to this point through two different avenues. So one is through my own history of my own works. And the other one is, uh, I would like to mention this as well, is my participation in the so-called a future panel on synthetic life. So, so this was actually uh, the future panel on synthetic life was assembled about two years ago 
by the, the Rathenau Institute in the Netherlands uh, uh, as part of the BASIC program. It's, it's, it's a research program called a BASIC and it's about building a synthetic cell. And this, they, they got a huge grant and the goal is to start now and create not only synthetic cells, but synthetic life in the next five to 10 years. And, but before they start the work, they assemble this future panel uh, uh, consisting not only of, of experts in synthetic life, but also, uh, also people like, also people from social science, public engagement, chemistry, physics, legal, ethics, medical, bio art, I think bio art, this is me, and risk assessment, management, biotech industry, and so on. So we convened uh, over the, um, over two years, every 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 other every couple of months, and we we were kind of discussing the the the, the possible the questions and the possible uh, the possible the potential that the creation that the creation and introduction of synthetic life and synthetic synthetic cells uh, might bring. So we were trying to map the risks and the benefits, but also the social challenges and dilemmas which we will face when synthetic life synthetic cells will interact with uh, traditional life. Um, and it's, yeah, we, we really uh, listed all these uh, dilemmas and during this process of discussion and imagination of possible synthetic life, I was really wondering about the legal status of this uh, emerging synthetic life. And it, it might be derived partially from existing cells or organisms, or it might also be created uh, de novo, but in any case, what would be the actual legal status of this life? And I'm not talking about the, the biosafety uh, uh, or kind of the regulation aspects of it. I'm more interested in the question, if this, if this life and if we attribute life to it, then do we also need to give it the same respect and the rights that we give and attribute to, uh, to, to other life? So. I will not really go into the detailed recommendation of the future panel because it's a really long paper and it covers a lot of ground, but we, it will be out later this year and we're also working on a, on a shorter, more, uh, more digestible version of this and hopefully this will also be uh, published soon. So uh, I would also like to bring up, uh, to take a step back uh, and to treat these questions and dilemmas uh, through my own work. And actually, we, we heard before from uh, uh, about the, the idea of turning into trees. And this was actually one project which I did with uh, Shiho or back in the RCA in 2002, which is amazingly already 19 years ago. And uh, our tutors at the time were Donatan and Fiona Rabi, who later went on to create speculative design. Um, but there we, we kind of proposed the idea of, um, of, encode, of transferring and encoding human DNA with the DNA of the tree, and we were using kind of silent, a silent mutation based encoding method that does not affect the phenotype of the tree, but it stores the, the human DNA within the DNA of the tree and thus creates a, a living memorials or transgenic tombstones, as uh, they were called at the press on, at the time. So you could, uh, so we were treating DNA as a shareable pointer from actually human life that could be encoded as potential suspended, but still live within the DNA of a tree. And we were, of course, we were very interested in the technology and how to do this, but very much, but, uh, but we were even more interested in what kind of rituals and what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of, what kind of type of memorials or approaches could evolve with this kind of tree. So for example, hugging a tree would suddenly, uh, have a completely different meaning if the DNA of your grandmother would be encoded within the tree. Yeah? And it would also create some sort of dilemma because if you would have the Granny Smith, right? And you would have really the, okay, if your name would be Smith and your grandmother would be Smith, then would you eat the apple from uh, your grandmother's tree? Right? So, so this is, uh, yeah, you're, you're not, you're laughing because you saw this 20 years ago. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and uh, this, a step forward now, and this this was the picture where when I was working at the University of Tokyo in the Institute of Medical Science as a as a bioinformatician, and one morning I went to the the lab and I counted this picture on the left. So, so 
there were hundreds of researchers queuing up, half of them in lab coats, and they were slowly proceeding to this, to this, to this, uh, to this nice table with a lot of flowers, and they were offering um, flowers, and they, they were laying down flowers and offering prayers. And I only realized later that this was a memorial service for, uh, for research anim animals to com commemorate, to pay respect, and to ask for the forgiveness of the lives that has been sacrificed in the name of research. And this was at the, the institute is now called Institute for Medical Science, but originally it was called Institute for Infectious Diseases. And at that time, uh, horses, uh, like, like that um, maybe 100 or 80, 90, 100 years ago, horses were used to create antitoxins and serums. And that's why, that's why the dedication on this memorial stone here is actually uh, in the name of farm animals. So we were remembering farm animals in particular to, for their sacrifice in producing uh, vaccines. And uh, this is actually a picture that was taken a couple of weeks ago. Uh, on the left is, is Hideo, on the right, this is me. And we he are here at, uh, at Waseda University, um, also uh, following the memorial service for research animals, uh, bacteria and, and plants. And um, yeah, actually, I didn't realize I was still wearing the, 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 the gloves because we were, so he and I, we were coming directly from the lab and the, the, this memorial space was set up actually right next to the lab areas. So not, not outside at, at a nice place. So, so we were really, uh, yeah, I just saw it when I realized when I, when I saw this picture. So this was not intentional. Um, and again, we have the same, we have flowers which were, offered on this, this uh, little altar and uh, a prayer was also offered. And uh, what was new to me, there was also this list of, uh, uh, so this is Hideo. So this is the list of the animals that have been uh, uh, sacrificed in the name of research. And Hideo, he managed to change that did not only include animals, but also bacteria and plants. And for, for plants, we couldn't count them. So, so they, they just said like, uh, uh, no num like un unnumbers, yeah? So, so, so this is quite, uh, so we have kind of genetic memorials now, and we also have memorials for uh, animals, bacteria and plants. And, uh, and I, I think uh, you, you, Hideo, you will hear later from him where he talks about his uh, artificial memorial for artificial life and lab equipment and, and lab tools. So, uh, and he will also offer the joint, uh, uh, joint offering. He will do the joint memorial later on. So um, another project I would like to briefly talk about is this, and this is what's called, or it's called Ghost in the Cell. And uh, this can be actually seen as a memorial for a, a virtual idol, if you want. So um, we created a, a synthetic, a text-based genome for this virtual idol called Hatsune Miku and asked the community to kind of modify, edit and add genes uh, and, and add genes uh, to the genome. So Hatsune Miku is a so-called virtual idol. So she originated as an illustration on top of an artificial voice software, but through the power of the community, her, um, uh, she not only created music, but also her image and her depictions got alive uh, on its own. So, so there were music videos, her image was remixed, recreated, uh, and so on and so on. So, and she's, she's now even giving uh, concerts. And I think somebody actually tried to marry her a couple of years ago. I'm not sure uh, where that went. So she has a voice, she has an image. I'm not sure about the soul, but she definitely, definitely did not have a heart. So what we did, we, uh, we uh, got um, IPS cells from an, from an anonymous Japanese uh, donor and differentiated them into uh, cardiomyocytes, into heart cells. And we combined this with this synthetic uh, DNA, which the community created uh, for Hatsune Miku. So we had uh, left, we have the insulation. I'm not sure if you can see the cardiomyocytes beating on, on the, on the, on the right side, I, I hope it works. So we had this beating heart of this uh, virtual idol and um, 
we were re realizing that we were helping Hudson Miku to cross this border between her virtual digital world to our kind of actual uh, biological world, if you want, and this 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 act of that of of heart cells uh, beating, uh, signifying her presence in our world. But of course, the 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 the, the the heart cells also stopped beating at some point, and uh, we didn't really take this as a as dying, but just as a as a as a the beat the, the beating of the heart cells signified for us the the passage back to her own uh, uh, digital world. So this brings me to this the copyright talk uh, of my uh, uh, corporate portion of my talk, and I would like to. To, to share a little thought experiment with you and then maybe come to the dilemma and see if we can solve it. So um, I would like to set the scene in, this, in, the, in, the, in the legal framework. So I guess everybody knows this, but whenever you take a, a photograph, right, with the camera, uh, whoever takes the copyright, whoever presses the shutter button, automatically uh, obtains the copyright of the picture, right? So you, take, you press the button, the copyright is yours. It's a little bit different in cinema. In cinema, the, the copyright of the film belongs to the director and not to the actual cameraman. But yeah, this is for moving images. But there was um, in about, I think 2011, there was a, quite an interesting case when a photographer left um, a camera in the jungle in Borneo and uh, yeah, he put his equipment there, he put the camera there, and he, yeah, he, he, he went somewhere else. And what happened then, the, these, uh, these uh, macaque monkeys, they came, were curious about the, the camera, and pressed the shutter, and they took pictures of themselves. So, and the question is, or oh, the question at the time was, who does this copyright belong to? Because the pictures are really great, you know? So, and the, and the photographer argued, he set it up, it should be his copyright. But uh, uh, animal rights act activists they actually uh, argued that because the animals took the picture, it should be their copyright. And this actually resulted in a court case. Um, uh, the court then finally ruled that the, uh, the animals, uh, the, 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 the monkeys, could not obtain the copyright on grounds that they are not a human person, right? So this is interesting. So what if we were to uh, create this scenario, but not with, uh, with actual monkeys, but with uh, human cells? So what if I were to, to create, a, to immortalize my own cells, to create a, a cell line, uh, to create an installation and, and a setup that would allow the, the growth of the cell uh, to physically trigger. So, so maybe the, you can imagine some wire when the cell grows, uh, they, they would strip the wire and this wire then would, uh, would release the, sh the, the shutter of the camera. So what would, what would this mean to the copyright? Would the resulting picture have my copyright? And what about after my death? Yeah. So when I'm dead, but my cell, li my cell line, my immortal cell line would still be alive, would a picture taken by my cells would still have my copyright? And this brings us to this. So what if we take another cell line? What if we were to take the most famous cell line of all time? So the healer, the Henrietta Lacks cell line. I'm sure everybody here is aware of the uh, circumstances, circumstances, the cells were taken and the lack of permission and the lack of consent and the following commercial, commercial, commercialization of the cells without compensation to the Henry de Lux, to Henry de Lux and her family. I really don't want to go uh, too deep into the discussion about the moral and ethical problems uh, that surround the, the healer cells. I would rather uh, refer to a work by, by Jonat and, and Orat and the Tissue Culture and Art Project uh, which is called uh, Better Dead Than Dying, where they, uh, uh, where they actually uh, took the silhouette, so you're not, please correct me if I got it wrong, but you get a silhouette and you, you grow the healer cells within this, uh, this silhouette of, the, uh, of, of Henry, Henry the Lux embodying her uh, living shadow and eventually the cells consumed all the, 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 consumed all the nutrients in this, uh, in this 
uh, in this growth chamber and the cells died and turning this incubator into uh, a death chamber and into a memorial for Henry de Lux. So I think it's a very, uh, yeah, a well-known and also very poetic work. So, but back to our uh, hypothetical experiment. If we were to grow the, uh, the healer cells, what if, uh, so, so what would it mean if the cells would have the agency to trigger the shutter release and take the, 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 the picture? Would it mean that the healer cells, would it mean that Henrietta Lux itself would have the copyright of the picture? And would this legal recognition of the copyright also legally restore her ownership over her own cells and over her own body? Yeah, so and these questions of agency and the legal status will also apply to the, uh, to the emerging uh, synthetic and hybrid life forms. Uh, so, and, and how can we uh, enter into a dialogue with this life and how can we ask uh, for permission and not only for forgiveness? Yeah, and this, this is my talk. I would like to thank uh, Hideo Osaki in the Metaphors community so Margarete Yamana de Angerante and Inge Bakreichele at Bioclub Tokyo, the Rathenau and the panel members and also Michael Schneider from the Print Research Group. Okay, thank you very much. That is so wonderful. Thank you so much, Georg. That, that really lays out a wonderful kind of dilemma for, for who has agency, who has ability to have copyright. Um, some beautiful examples right there. We will be having a Q&A um, after our next speaker, Jonat Zur, and then all of you will be able to ask both Georg and Jonat some questions about their talk, all right? So we're gonna, we're gonna keep rolling along here. Jonat, I'm gonna leave it up to you. If you wanna do your own screen, go for it. If you wanna do our screen, go for um, it. I will share my screen now. And while, she, while she's doing that, I'm going to give you a quick introduction, Yona, so they all know who you are. I think most people do, but let's let's let everybody. Um, so uh, Yona Zur is from Symbiotica at the University of Western Australia in Perth. Uh, she is Dr. Zur is an artist and academic. She is chair of the fine arts discipline at the School of Design, a researcher and an academic coordinator of Symbiotica the Center for, of Excellence in Biological Arts at the University of Western Australia. Yona is considered a pioneer in the field of biological arts, and I would say one of the major pioneers. She's published widely and exhibited internationally in museums such as the Pompidou Center in Paris, the MoMA in New York City, Mori Art Museum, Ars Electronica, National Art Museum of China, and more. Yona's ideas and projects reach beyond the confines of art. Her work is often cited as inspiration to diverse areas such as new materials, textiles, design, architecture, ethics, fiction, and food. And so Yona's talk will be titled Outsourcing the Female Body. And let's see if we can get the spotlight back on Yona there and then uh, get started. Um, good morning, good evening. Um, thank you so much, Georg, for your wonderful talk. We're both sharing a 3 a.m. in the morning talk. So I'm going to read my talk. I'm terribly sorry, but just to make sure that I'm making sense. So um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge that I am uh, the Nunga Wujuk people, traditional custodian of the land that I'm sitting in at the moment. Uh, I wish to acknowledge the strength of the continuing culture and offer my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, my talk was, um, the prompt for my talk is birth. Um, I'm not going to give birth on stage here. Instead, I'll read um, my slides. So in this presentation, uh, I would like to illustrate some of the realities and some of our fantasies in relation to an, the endeavor of outsourcing the female body, especially as it relates to the reproductive body. 
As you will see, I am attem attempting to avoid discussion which concerned only with the human body and touching also on the non-human biological and the machinic body. As humans engineer living system, life forms are isolated and reduced to their component parts. In essence, privileging information of a context. Ron and myself, sorry, my collaborator, we call this DNA chauvinism. I'm going to be a bit provocative, sorry. Uh, for example, let's look at Craig Venter's Cynthia um, as a case study. Venter used the, an existing cells with all its machinery and components minus a strand of nucleic DNA. The DNA strands was read as a, as, and sequenced by a machine and inserted back into the incubation body, the cell uh, which is then put into growth medium environment. Venter responds to accusation of misleading the public by claiming to have made life on scratch in which the mother is a computer by holding a DNA centric position, dismissing the argument as neo vitalist. And I'll quote Vitalism today manifests itself in the guise of shifting emphasis away from the DNA to an emergent property of the cell that is somehow greater than the sum of its molecular parts and how they work in a particular environment. End of quote. What Venter may reflect is a womb envy, <laughs> as technically the only part the male contributes to the act of love creation is a strand of DNA, while it is the female body which provides the cell, the womb, and external environment. This one case study expresses what Aristokova refers to as, quote, ictogenic desire, and the anxiety uh, wit of the maternal, an anxiety that usually manifests itself in a philosophical, literary, and scientific aspiration towards self-creation. Outsourcing the female body, uh, the female reproduction body can be traced back to more than 300,000 years, uh, years to the Egyptian that used uh, heat generated by manure and charcoal. Mechanical incubating known as artificial mother was invented in 1747 by René Romore in, in France. And the first commercial incubator was developed by Charles Hearson in 1881. This early invention enabled eggs to mature without the need for a hen. And they also enabled the year round supply of chickens. Through the ability to simulate the hen's brooding function, chickens and eggs became the in an industrial commodity engineered by human technology. The same technology was adopted in the late 19th century, early 20th century to humans' bodies. And this is what you see here. Uh, it's neonatal incubators, um, which were originally modeled after um, chicken incubators. But you can see that people could actually come uh, to view those incubator uh, as a show, as a, almost like a freak show, if you want. People had to pay to view the wonder inside the incubator. Um, the display was positioned near other exotic display, especially in the Coney Island, such as, um, you know, the bearded woman or the two-headed goat. Um, later development of the human incubator um, intriguing not so much as um, technological development as it follows same principle as the chicken and microbiological incubators, but rather because of how it was positioned within perceived and understood and presented to society. Incubator aesthetic and the design of packaging in which the abstractor womb simulator resided had much to do with capturing the public imagination and played the major role in articulation of the life inside the machine. And let's look at today. Um, okay, I'll show you some more pictures of the incubators. Here you see what is interesting in this slide, you can see that baby incubators for sale for both hospital and amusement parks on the left side. Okay, and let's move um, to the desire of an artificial womb. 
and um, differently to the neonatal in, uh, to the pre prenatal incubator, artificial womb means the attempt to, on top of um, constructing an incubator, to um, replicate a synthetic placenta. And the development of the artificial womb started already in 1958 when Westin et al. Um, cannulated the umbilical vessel of seven pre-viable human fetuses in a warm perfusion chamber and connected these to a spiral plexiglass film oxygenator prolonging life of up to 12 hours. And current research uh, done into ex vivo uterine environment, which is in short Eve, such a provo provocative name, um, uh, done in, in my university, in the University of Western Australia, in collaboration with the Hoku University in Japan. And I would like, hopefully, this video will play. And you can see, actually, um, this lamp. Let's see. Oh, it's playing. And I don't know if you can hear the sound, but there is um, the sound of all the machinery that is working. And this is the... Um, Oh, I don't know if it's going to play. Okay, you can imagine this little lamp inside a um, plastic bag with attached to uh, artificial placenta growing with all the beeps of the machine. Okay, oops, we will stop that. And, oh, here it is. I am moving on. Uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> technology. Luckily, we don't have life in this technology. Okay, moving on. And um, the research was then presented or performed also in the context of uh, in context of art. Again, we have this blur uh, as part of the Ars Electronica Festival in 2018. Um, however, this time the only bodies and labor on stage are the machinic ones. All other biological bodies are concealed. Again, we can see here the blur between science, arts, the spectacle, and imagining of futures. We can see what bodies and labor are revealed and which and what bodies are concealed. But why should we be anthropocentric and think that it is only human species which with the ambition to outsource care and reproduction? In our peace vessel of care and control, the compostcubator, we relegated the care and maintenance of the cell from the mechanical, electrical, cybernetic feedback system to, uh, to a living care system maintained by bacterial activity of breaking down the organic matter in the compost. The heat generated by the compost used to heat the incubator on top of the compost pile. Inside the, inside the incubator, we had a flask with cells growing. So you can see it here. Uh, potentially, we aim, to, we aim to grow muscle cell in vitro meat inside the incubator uh, using compost technology. And you can see some of the research that was done in uh, King's College in um, England, London, and we managed to grow some cells outside in uh, freezing cold London. This is a project we conducted uh, already in the year 2000 when we grew meat from a lamb in utero um, in Harvard Medical School. To, in order to consume and eat it. And what we can see here is basically meat with no body and without a parent. We human artists, we're just elaborating on the Mali flower. You can see it here, the Australian birds, which is notable for a large nesting compost pile constructed and maintained by the males in which the eggs are incubated and the lack of parental care during and after incubation. So basically, um, the, the 
uh, female put her eggs in the compost pile that the male is looking after. And you can see it here. An incubator can be simply described as an isolated environment that controls heat, humidity, and in some cases, additional elements such as gas content, pH level, and other environmental condition. It is a homostatic feedback-based uh, dynamic surrogate body that shields fragile life from the external environment. Generally, incubators are taken for granted in contemporary uh, biotech world, while other technological control systems such as molecular intervention take center stage. We argue that replacing the, and the grounding of life in a code such as DNA with a context or environment dependent basis constitute more than a scientific issue. It is a, an ideologically uh, charged view of life. Yes, so you can see here the common incubator and the, what we call the aesthetic of invisibility. It's one of the most boring transparent um, apparatus we created. And this may serve to make the cell and tissue devoid of agency, extracted abstractor from the body from which they were derived, as well as from the body they have become. In addition, it renders the technology invisible and therefore neural, a neutral or even natural, like Mother Earth, without any footprint on the environment, an autotrophic artificial uh, mother. And I will just want to um, finish with, um, you know, once we outsource the uh, female body to an automation, we still have bodies who are looking and maintaining after those uh, machines. And uh, let us not forget the hidden labor behind and inside the outsourced female body, which carry the inglorious maintenance duties of cleaning, of changing, of uh, looking after it. Um, following, we are currently doing uh, research into automation, and we all know, following current research of automation, that the aim to move from the human uh, division of labor to non-human labor is hard to achieve. And there is a lot, uh, rather than sentient labor, um, rather the sentient labor is further hidden, fragmented, and feminized. And when I say feminized, I do not mean in terms of sex. I mean in terms of the traditional uh, roles of uh, women that has, is now taken by immigrants and people from other socioeconomic, low socioeconomic uh, situation. Um, and with that, I would like to, to open everything for uh, conversation and say thank you for everyone for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yona. That's, that was an absolutely wonderful talk. These themes of feminized labor, uh, I love your term, inglorious maintenance duties, and the incubator as an aesthetic of invisibility. Really fantastic thoughts. So let's open it up. We have 10 minutes now. We're doing great staying on time. You guys are amazing. Um, we have 10 minutes here that we can do a question and answer with these two wonderful people, such a, a richness in who we have speaking here today. So what, what are some questions from the audience? You can uh, unmute yourself, I think. And, uh... I'll ask us a quick question just to get us started out. Um, Yona, where do you see the future of this going in terms of synthetic biology and some of the issues about when we outsource life from the female body and also female control? Um, wh where do you see these issues going and what are some of the dangers we might be facing or, or the advances in the future? Um, okay, I think, because I, I spoke directly with the person who's um, working with the artificial uh, womb or the artificial placenta. And um, even he said that they, you know, th that we will never be able to completely um, uh, replicate the placenta 
that this is just, you know, the name is, a, again, a name uh, that is evocative for our public imagination, but the function of uh, his uh, artificial womb is to give, uh, a, you know, a baby maybe a week or two weeks um, um, opportunity to live. So if the, the um, um, embryo is born a um, week or two earlier to what considered today is viable, this gives an extension of life. Uh, where do we see, the, where do I see it going? Again, the more I do uh, research about automation, the more I realize that um, automation does not save us labor. It rather um, makes it hidden. And, um, you know, you can take even example from non-biotechnology uh, such as uh, Amazon or Facebook. And there are many, many uh, human bodies and non-human bodies that are maintaining our, you know, illusion and fantasy of automation. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, it won't be so easy to get rid of, um, of the, the human body and the human labor that is involved. And that includes also in terms of um, reproduction. I think, uh, yeah, one of the advancements, and maybe Gyo can um, uh, talk more about that, is that uh, we can now, you know, the bodies that are becoming more obsolete are rather the male ones, rather than the female ones, um, because, uh, you know, we can, as, as uh, Craig Venter um, showed us, we can um, um, replicate uh, DNAs, we can sequence and then print it and insert it into the cell but we cannot replicate the cell itself. It is the, actually the environment that is harder to um, synthesize uh, because of its complexity, because of its interdependency. That's wonderful. What a wonderful answer. I wanna give Georg a chance to respond to that too. And then I see Caroline Jones' hand is up next. So Georg, uh, what, what thoughts do you have on that issue? Thank you, Jana. Let's see, Georg, uh, unmute yourself if you would, please. Yes, I was muted. So yeah, no, I can only uh, subscribe uh, what Jonat says. And, and it kind of also made me think that uh, the term computer was also used for female uh, laborers, right? Originally, who were making calculations. So that's, 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 I just realized again that if we speak of a computer, or computers are also female, or. Are, are they female? Yeah, they are historically female, right? So it's kind of interesting. And yeah, and that, that in labs, that the human are the most source of error, right? So this kind of repeatability. And yeah, this eliminating this source of error, that, that, that's kind of an interesting, this male error, right? So eliminating this male error with female, um, uh, yeah, precision. <laughs> Is, is that yes, era, era and error? Like, how are you using that word, Gary? Yeah. The era of uh, maleness as well as the error. Are you speaking to both of that? Or I'm, I'm doing a play yeah, on yeah. words with what you said. I think we have some questions. We do. Caroline, uh, would you like to unmute and ask a question? I hope I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for these two beautifully intersecting talks. I have a couple of questions or thoughts. One, putting them both together, Picabia, of course, and uh, the poet Oscar Haviland called the camera, the daughter born without a mother. But the themes of technological replacements for the female, of course, go back centuries. Uh, right back to Descartes' dream of his geometric lover. Anyway, um, in the field of environmental justice, which I always want to connect to the SynBio world, there is a movement to give rights to the more than human. So for Georg, I want to know, and maybe Ionat has a, has a view here, when are our factory bacteria going to have a labor union? When will they have rights? Yeah, so, so is this a problem of communication? So, so, so how can we communicate with them? How can we meaningfully uh, 
communicate right. with the bear there. And once we can do this, then I think it's very soon. Yeah? Well, we, we, we have the optic of thriving and not thriving. And some of the panelists already have used this with their mycelial. The mycelial are happy when they can expand and grow into a medium, right? So we have these intuitions of how to um, address the rights of our living collaborators. Um, you know, we there's much speculation in um, IP about the singularity and when machines will have consciousness and demand labor unions, but we really have not yet, you know, the animal rights movement has pushed agriculture behind the black box. Um, and I just wonder when bacteria will, and you know, the fungi of, of the yeast community will assert themselves. So that's just a provocation. That is a wonderful question, Caroline. And, uh, you know, Paul Venus does a lot of work on that in terms of the unpaid l labor of cells and organisms and, and uh, kind of assumptions about how, what the use value of an organism is. And I think that also gets back a little bit to some of what uh, Marietta was talking about this morning and some of the writing she does about whose lives matter and whose lives are grievable in terms of what kind of degree of sentience we give them and acknowledge their sense of being, their sense of being. So wonderful, wonderful discussion right there. Um, be brave people, we have about four more minutes. Here's your chance to ask some wonderful speakers some questions. And we have a lot of really interesting people in the audience. Andy, do you have a question? Or no, that was your five minute signal. No, I, I actually did have a question at ah, this point yay. too. Okay, let's so, yes, go. Uh, after looking at all the images of the neonatal incubators and then thinking about the, um, the idea of the shrine that you were talking about, Greg, uh, with for dead animals, how, or not dead, dead animals and dead bacteria and the things for research, how much of that is a combination of that putting things on for show because in research, we do kill a large amount of organisms, but every time we wash our hands, we kill a huge number of microbes that are on our hands. Every time we flush a toilet, we are getting rid of a lot of bacteria. So if we're thinking about when are things for show and when are we putting things as a freak show, I'm not saying that that's what's happening, but where do we draw that line for something like a shrine for dead research organisms? Oh, now you are getting so, so rich there, Andy, because you are anticipating our evening plenary, which is Hideo's um, memorial service for lab organisms and um, inanimate tools and lab objects. So thank you. Thank you for that lead in. That's great. And I see a hand that Roland has up. Roland, do you want to join us here? Thanks for that question, Andy. Yes, <clears throat> thanks, Carolyn. I have a question for both uh, Georg and Ionat, but it's actually more questions which you kind of ask to each other, because I was curious what Ionat's reaction would be to Georg's thought experiment, um, namely if Hela cells were to make a selfie of themselves, would Henrietta Lex get the copyright uh, posthumously, or what's the agency of the Hela cells in terms of uh, copyright? And then for Georg, the question is, what do you think of these aesthetics of invisibility of the incubator, because I know you work a lot with laboratory tools in your own artworks. I wondered if you ever thought about this invisibility aesthetics, what your opinion is on that. Okay. Oh, wow, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so <laughs> I can't answer that again. And so I'll, I'll just, again, some thoughts about that. How much are the cells of Henrietta Lacks are actually Henrietta Lacks? Also, um, these are the cells that killed Henrietta Lacks. So, you know, we, we need to think about that. Um, again, I think this is different to the more symbolic as an artist, you know, we are doing, as uh, Andy said, more kind of ritual, symbolic ritual to discuss those kind of social uh, questions. And that's why we do all, you know, like the, um, if you want putting things on display and performing them. 
So I think, again, what the family of Henrietta Lacks is going through, which and, and I support the request for some recognition, is different to what the actual cells are. You know, it's the symbolic value of the cell. Um, I, I think that, you know, honestly, the cells themselves don't give a damn about whether it is a selfie or not selfie. Um, there is so much, we, all our discussion about other organisms is very much anthropocentric. And, you know, even when I talk about the female body, when we look at bacteria, there's no female or male, there are so many diverse kinds of sexes and reproduction um, um, strategies and things like that. So uh, if you ask me about what the, the um, Hela cell line itself thinks about it, um, I think that, yeah, they say, oh, well, you deal with this question. I have other questions I need to deal with. But then again, probably I have no idea what they're thinking. That's a fantastic actually, answer. Go I ahead, remember you. when we, actually, I told you uh, when, when Caroline and you were in Tokyo like three years ago, three years ago, actually, I, I, I talked to you about this idea and, and you, I think your, your initial response was that whether I'm using the healer cells or whether I'm uh, putting uh, her to work, right? Uh, and this was actually a very, uh, was a very provoking uh, uh, response, which, which of course I, I do not want to do, but the, the, the rich history and the problematic history of the healer cells uh, makes this discussion necessary. And it's not only the fact that it's a known line, but also uh, the provenance and, and, it, and it's a, that's why I, 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 it is a, a hypothetical experiment, not, not, not an actual one. That's why I didn't really want to show HeLa cells either, you know, so, so uh, I would like to uh, take a little step back. Um, about incubators, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, Yes, so, so we, we take this lab equipment granted, but it's it's always interesting to see the, I think the work you did, you guys did in, in Kenpoku with the bee incubator, right? With, uh, so so where, where the heat of the bees actually created this and, and this was a beautiful way to, to, to not, to not, uh, to, to expand, not, not expand the lab, but, but to bring the life outside the lab and, uh, and and make it happen anywhere. So yeah, I'm sorry. This doesn't make sense. It's 5 a.m. now. <laughs> you're you're hanging in there, Georg. And we're yeah. so glad that you could join us after just moving and getting your internet but set up. Just one more response to a previous question about the 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 bacteria and killing bacteria. And I think Hita will talk about it later. But one part of their uh, part of their ritual is also to make pizza, right? So so, mm -hmm. so to, to let yeast ferment and then. Uh, pray together with the pizza oven and then eat the pizza together, you know, so, so it's not, there's quite a humor side of it. At, at, yeah, at yeah, too. we get into the humor of it. This is, this is a really provocative discussion and, and in part we started last year in the bioart and design track when our title was the state of the organisms and asking what do the organisms need, what, what is happening. And I think it also goes back to a re reflection in terms of the discussion Lacan had with French feminists when he asked the French feminists uh, uh, in terms of the concept of lack, lackingness as part of the female identity. And he said, what do you want? <laughs> you know, to which they wouldn't answer because it was a, a nonsensical kind of question in terms of uh, assumption of absence when something doesn't meet your own definition of the other. So on that note, let's, let's wrap up this panel and um, we are gonna move straight into our next one. Uh, we have a set of three wonderful speakers and I'm wondering, I'm not sure who's in controls. Could we um, highlight, highlight Katie Pfeiffer and um, Fitria Ayuningtas and Saiful Garibaldi, and then we want to pull up Manisha Mohan. If we get those three people, maybe in our in our box, or we just do the slide. That 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 would be a good way to do it. Yeah, let's do it this way. This is great. Okay, so we we have a panel with uh, three talks following uh, on the. Th 
theme, the title of the panel is called Envisionments of Utopia, Recycle and Death, and is moving straight forward from what we were just talking about, approaching the subject matter in a variety of ways. So our first panelist to speak is gonna be Katie Pfeiffer. She's from the University College of London in the United Kingdom. Katie is an anthropology PhD researcher at UCL looking at the design and use of biomaterials in the UK. Part of her research involves considering topics of ethics, care, and more than human relations. Her talk is titled Utopian Objects, Biodesign, and the Moving Horizon. So Katie, let's see, let's uh, go to the next slide there. I'm not sure, there we go. And Katie, do you want to see if it works with you having control of the slides? Yeah, we're, I was we're just going to try that. Yeah, um, we're kind of, we're trying to figure out how to do this on Zoom where the panelists can move them forward. So bear with us, audience. It seems to be working. That's All right, right. Um, nice. Thank you for the introduction, Carolyn. Uh, as a caveat to my research, and as Carolyn said, I'm an anthropologist. So I'm not a biodesigner, I am not a bioartist. Um, so I'm approaching things from a slightly different lens. Uh, and as a second caveat, I'm still in quite the early days of my research. So I have more questions right now than answers. And what I'll be sharing with you today is kind of a theoretical framework around one of my thorniest research questions. Um, and the flow of this talk is gonna track against the title. So moving from an understanding of utopia to understandings of how some biodesign objects may be considered utopian. Uh, and the conclusion, again, is not so much a discovery, but a provocation I have for you all. Uh, so before launching into the meat of the presentation, we need to align on what utopia means and what kind of utopia we're talking about. Um, according to the Marxist philosopher of utopia, Ernest Bloch, the utopian impulse is a given of the human condition. So it's the impulse to imagine or to long for a life otherwise. And specifically, utopic thinking asks how life could be otherwise and how life should be otherwise. And this should, I think, is really important um, because it points to the evaluative aspect of utopia. So this is something that I'm going to return to later in the talk. Uh, but for now, it's worth noting that this evaluation exists as a comparison point to the present. So to think utopically is to oscillate between a present and a projection into the future and then to compare those two iteratively. Um, now, there are multiple ways to, uh, sorry, the thing just changed. That's okay. Um, yeah. Let's see, is that on our end or your end? No, it's not me. Okay, so um, Kalamari or Ed, 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 Eduardo, can you reestablish the sl slide deck there? And just scroll down. We'll find it in just a second for you here, Katie. Okay, I'm yeah, sorry, my bad. Just share my screen so Eduardo can do what he wants on the back end. Either way, Katie, you want to pull it up quickly? Yeah, I can do that. Sorry about that. That's okay. These are the kind of glitches we'll have when we're trying to figure out the system. Um. Sorry, actually, this isn't working out. Um, okay, Eduardo, can you reestablish the slide deck to her slide? Yes, sure. Let's see. One minute. Yeah, just bear with us for a minute. We'll get it pulled back up, and then Katie, we will give you your time back once you start. Oh, no worries. Sweet, we're back. Um, uh, so uh, again, if we're, we're thinking utopically, like there's different ways that you could have a utopia. Um, and Bloch, uh, the, the Marxist philosopher I had mentioned a second ago, uh, he distinguishes between abstract utopia and concrete utopia. Um, so an abstract utopia is a kind of daydream. Um, and you can see this as like the solar punk aesthetic, uh, which is a kind of wishful thinking. It's an escapism, um, but it does not necessarily present a plan to the future. And utopian scholar Ruth Levitus writes that concrete utopia, on the other hand, quote, reaches forward into a real possible future and involves not merely wishful thinking, but willful thinking. And this breakdown is similar to what Miguel Ebensor describes as a heuristic utopia versus a systematic utopia. And both of them suggest that there is a difference when there is a plan. 
Now, um, bio designs, hopefully moving forward. Uh, bio designs could be either type. Um, so when you think about speculative design versus material design for commercial purposes, um, they clearly have different functions. Uh, and I will focus in on one type in a second. Um, but first, I want to question, if bio designs are utopic, what do they do? Um, and I believe that they could be considered educating objects, which teaches one how and what to desire. This, uh, source suggests, is the purpose of utopian work generally that it enacts the education of desire, that they teach, quote, the desire to desire better, to desire more, and above all, to desire differently. Going forward. Um, now, this talk is going to focus specifically on commercialized or commercializing biodesigns and on concrete utopias. Um, so that's utopic thinking with a trajectory. And in discussions with practicing biodesigners, I frequently hear about how their goal of their product like spans out across time and space. Um, so a design of a material made of bacterial cellulose or mycelium like this one, for instance, uh, could really be about the elimination of waste or the regeneration of our land or the end of carbon emissions. And what I find particularly fascinating about these objects, which educate desire, which enable us to think about a qualitatively different world, is that it exists within our current market economy and sensibilities. So this means that they balance a future trajectory and the future education of desires with what's commercially available now. And all of this makes sense in some ways. Um, this balance between like commercial realities and future anticipations, uh, as done in Ravi. Uh, in a consumer society like ours, it is, quote, through the buying of goods that reality takes place. The moment money is exchanged, a future possible becomes real. Um, and I realize, having gotten through about half of this, that this might not be the most intuitive understanding of utopia, uh, but there is a theoretical frame that supports it. Um, and as these biodesigns exist today, but point towards an alternative other, I would argue that they could be considered a version of an everyday utopia. Um, and everyday utopias, unlike perfect utopias, which are by definition impossible, are defined by their contingent nature. Uh, social scientists like Davina Cooper or Eric Olin Wright uh, in their works, Everyday Utopia and Envisioning Real Utopia, spell out that it's the imperfect reality and fuzzy boundaries of realized utopic visions. Um, and they argue that it's through the everyday utopia's very realization, so their physical presence, that they enact their purpose. And this is important uh, because everyday utopias exist within a current system. Um, Cooper provides examples of this um, from quite prosaic things, so like a lesbian bathhouse in Toronto, or um, this is an image of Hyde Park Speaker's Corners, or moneyless trading schemes in the north of the UK. Um, and this is interesting because these are things that are not outside of our everyday life. So it's sex or sharing opinions or the market economy, um, but they pose an alternative way of being today. Uh, so they provide a productive disjuncture with the status quo through their proximity to it. And getting back to biodesigns and kind of the, the purpose of this talk, um, I would argue that physical functioning biodesigns work similarly. Uh, to paraphrase Levitas again, they make the future tangible. In physically manifesting an alternative, they critique our widespread unsustainable approaches and in our uncaring relationship with the living in the natural world. And I've heard this time and time again in my discussions with biodesigners, that our production system not only should be different, but it could be different, and their work proves it. Um, but as these designs exist today, uh, they're often tainted by our present reality. So in the present world, um, in an ideal state, a designer would not have to make concessions as they brought a product to market um, through prototyping and scaling, but oftentimes they do. Um, so for example, um, I heard of a designer who was trying to make an alternative to pleather. And they wanted to create something that was completely bio-benign, uh, but questions kind of kept emerging. So will it uh, perform in the way that people expect today when buying a leather alternative? Will it be completely waterproof, um, scratch resistant? Will it be shiny? Will it have the same aesthetics? And like, maybe it will, but maybe not. And for the product to sell today and to start moving towards a more biodegradable future by replacing plastics right now, uh, the designer often has to grapple with things like whether or not to use plastic binders or coatings. Um, 
And I think uh, that it should become clear that there are many ways that things become very messy when realizing utopian vision. Um, and I think this scales to things like conversations around whether or not to patent, um, whether or not to try to protect your IP or be very, very open source. All of this is a consequence of the reality that we're existing with an occurrence um, in ideal system. And this brings us, I think, um, to the inherent paradox of these objects. So we've got biodesigns which function today, uh, which are bought and desired today, but which point us towards a better future as they educate the desire for something else. So uh, they invite the question of how do you open the aperture onto what should be, onto what one should desire through objects which are created in and responsive to are an ideal present. Um, how do you balance these impulses? And these are tensions that I hear uh, frequently and navigating them is genuinely fraught. So I've heard people say things like they feel like a failure or a fraud when they fail to live up to their own values in that moment. And I think this leads us to the trap or the double bind that utopian objects encourage, that they enable um, and encourage us to project into other futures while existing solidly within the present. So they invite evaluations across time and scales um, with shifting focal points. They exist, I think, uh, and this sounds a bit funky and maybe it'll be intuitive to you all, but they exist at multiple places and times in our evaluative imagination simultaneously. Um, so as these objects pull us towards a better future, they can slip out of sight altogether at times. Uh, the German historian Reinhard Koselleck uh, suggests that the horizon pulls us forward with expectations, but it's always out of reach. So I wonder, as the evaluative standard by which these objects are judged um, shifts radically across time and space, and perhaps to this unrealizable horizon, how does one make sense of them? Um, do you judge an object by today's standards or by the standards of a more perfect world? Uh, and all of this leads to a final question I have for you all, and it's still an unanswered research question of my own, um, is how does each biodesigner as an individual orient themselves as ethical actors within the context of, within the context of an ideal present on shifting grounds. Uh, thank you. And if any of you have um, any thoughts or responses to it, please um, um, look forward to it. All right, what a wonderful talk. That was very, very rich um, from an anthropological perspective. Thank you so much teaching how utopian objects teach us what to desire and how our imaginations change over the horizon. That is fantastic. Okay, we're gonna keep rolling along here. We're a little bit behind time, but not too bad. Um, so our next speakers are, we have a team from the Locust Foundation in Indonesia. We're so glad to have you here. Uh, our two speakers are Fitria Ayungtas and Saiful Garibaldi. Uh, Fitria is a PhD in, in engineering with research expertise in growing stem cells and tissue engineering. She has an interest in cross and multidisciplinary fields of study and loves to explore scientific phenomena from different perspectives. And her working, uh, uh, the other person in the team is Saiful, and he is an artist who's interested in the networked and interconnected nature of ecologies and the evocative power of microorganisms. He's currently studying a master's degree in environmental science. And also the two of them just won the award at the Biodesign Sprint Challenge. So <laughs> huge congratulations. I'm Thank so excited. You. Thank you. So excited Thank for you, Thank you so much. And they will co-present a talk called Recycle Archipelago and Local Ecosystems. Take it away, you two. <laughs> Thank you. Can we uh, can we share our on screen from our device? If you would like to do that, let's give it a yeah. try. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you see the the screen? Yes, 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 we can, and just put it in play mode. Yep. Perfect. You're okay. set to go. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning from here it's very early here in indonesia <laughs> but we love to see you uh, in my summit and we are so excited of this event 
So me, Fitria, and my partner here, Saiful, we are from Locus Foundation, Indonesia, and today we will talk about uh, recycle archipelago and local ecosystem. Okay. So yeah, this is a map of our country as maybe we know that Indonesia is one of the largest archipelagic country in the world with the bonus demography like high natural diversity and around 250 million inhabitants. We are fourth most populous country in the world. But we also have these disadvantages of this uh, demography because we are, we are located in the ring of fire. So we have this vulnerability in natural disaster and also the overpopulation uh, of human in our country. But yeah, from these advantages and disadvantages of the demography of Indonesia, we try to understand the nature of our archipelago and uh, through our institution we we built this collaborative work we call it locus foundation so we try to interconnecting between uh interdisciplinary fields like art science social study and also technology to find maybe the end goal is to find a problem solving for the you know, for, for the problems in our local problem in Indonesia and hopefully uh, we can use it to project it for a global uh, solution. And recently we focusing on biomaterial exploration. We we try to find a sustainable material such as Carolyn say in Biodesign Challenge, we also uh, presented our project for the alternative materials for electronic, electronic component. And then uh, the second is we want to emphasize the creative engagement with local ecosystem. So today uh, from two, two projects we would like to present, we would like to show our works on that field. And the first project we call it the Preputium Perspective. So it come from the, the idea come from the cultural heritage uh, named circumcision. Maybe uh, all of you have already know this process. The circumcision actually the process of removal of the tip of male genitalia. We call it Preputium in scientific terms, uh, following the rules in particular religion or culture. As we know that Indonesia is the country with highest Muslim population in the world, that's why this cultural heritage has been rooted uh, in our culture, uh, in Indonesian culture. And because of that, more than 30 million male children in Indonesia per 2019, as we get the data, have conducted this process and it's causing high amount of medical waste, which can be harmful for the ecosystem without a good management system. So from this idea, we would like to find a solution to recycling the medical waste uh, by uh, using, using the biotechnology. So we want to transform this preputium, this medical waste into something more valuable and could be useful for medical treatment. And this concept of circular sustainability and recycling process of medical waste can achieve into the cycle of life, like mimicking the cycle of life. So we want to take something from human and come back to human and it costs no harm for nature and no harm for living organism. And this project is uh, developed by interdisciplinary work uh from biotechnologies field and then art field and also social cult, uh, social study and this is the design thinking and the process is like we collect the sample from circumcision clinic in our local area because there's so many circumcision clinic here because this uh yeah many people have can object to conduct this process so there's a lot of uh, specific clinic for this and we get this 
sample of uh, proputium and we did transformation into we make a primary culture from this sample and we we can isolate the human skin cells which can be developed uh, into further uh, project so from this project we would like to understand that life cycle goes in circular system from birth growth death to rebirth regrowth and read that again and keep recycling the process all over again so we would like to understand that and yeah come back to the circular uh, system of the recycling process and this project will be continued to the next project uh, called Wounds Paradox. Uh, we, may, we will make a tattoo on the skin page uh, we, we develop from the skin cells, from isolated from the preputium. And we will uh, emphasize the paradox of the bad wound and good wound caused by tattoo. Uh, which is stigmatized in our country as a like a bad wound, but actually in Indonesia, tattoo also become the oldest. Uh, Indonesia uh, known as one of the country with the oldest tattoo culture in the world, and it starts since 12th century. So we would like to see that those paradox, and also. In the process, we would like to combine the local wisdom and heritage between tattoo process, circumcision process, and also the advanced science and technology like tissue engineering and cell sheet manipulation, for example. So yeah, that's uh, about the first project we did in Locus Foundation and my friend Saiful will uh, explain about the second project. Okay, thank you, Fitria. So the next project is what we call the Sasakrupa Kehirupan. So we designed this project together uh, this year, a public uh, art project in Bandung, Indonesia, with uh, we planning to apply it to 300 uh, meter long flyover uh, bridge. So this project used the green corridor concept responding to the environmental condition of the city in Bandung and their cultural history. And like uh, many city in elsewhere, like of the green space in the city center and as unstable ecosystem. Uh, Bandung is the one of the most populous city in Indonesia and with a population of 2.5 million people and an area with an area 165 kilometers. So, and then the city is from, uh, the form is like a, the basin and surrounded by the mountains and there are many agriculture land. So the project is, trying to connect the two local ecosystem in the in that area in the in the center of the city and then in the rural area and we know we, we name it the project is sasak rupa kahirupan in english uh, it says uh, bridge of the form of the life so from that idea uh, yeah and then this is the component of the work so we have the micro relief and then the, the micro using the micro composite and we have the relief story and we use the echo clad uh, technology and then also we try to uh, make the concept of the green corridor and then yeah this is the the recycle process so we started from the, the we, we collect the agricultural waste from the uh, rural area the and then we use the mycelium and then we create the, the micro composite to make the micro relief and then after that so the the wave also we we cut it again for the growth medium and then back again to the using for the the culture. for the for the culture yeah the agriculture this so this is the, one minute warning so keep going okay okay so yeah so so this is the the yeah the uh, the material as we know that it has uh, many the benefits so we using the vacuum forming also for the molding to make the micro relief thanks and then this is the visual uh, image we trying to make the culture with the pohachi, the figure as a symbol of the blessing welfare in the land of the Sunda and also Laswi, the Laskar, one in Indonesia. Okay, this one, the one of the woman hero in, in Bandung, Indonesia. And then, yeah, this is the, the green corridor concept. So we adapting the concept of the food chain on ecosystem and to introduce organism as well as invited organism. So we trying to make the, the bird perch. This one is uh, created by the uh, microcomposite also. And then the, the beehives. OK, 
Okay, next. Uh, this one the uh, it's like uh, the the Maso village in Cisarua, Bandung. So there's the many community. They has many uh, small farmers, medium farmers, and large farmers. They cultivation. They they mostly they they are the farmer from the mushroom. They like uh, oyster mushroom and then Ganoderma, and then also the land Lentinula endodes, and then another one. It started like uh, in the eighties. And then they have the concept of the sabilulungan. It's like the obligation of individual towards society and then sharing of burdens between the members of the community. And then the interaction can develop towards meaningful, long lasting friendship between the members of community and build the trust. So we trying to influence the industrial partner and the master farmer to make the, this project. It's like the social participatory. And this is the design of the, of, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is the, the 3D design of the, yeah, the, for, for, from the bridge, for, for the bridge. Right yeah, the bridge. so this is a relief and made from the composite. We yes. would like to apply in a public space around 300 uh, meters, right? Yes, around 300 meters. Okay. Flip flop. Yeah, and combined with the green corridor here. Okay. Okay. I think that's all from us, from Locus Foundation. Thank you very much for your attention, guys. Oh my goodness, you guys, that was fantastic. That is, that yeah. is so Sorry for taking quite a long it's, time for this no, event. No, you're doing fine. And we're just, we're running behind. We're gonna shorten the Q and A and probably go into the break a little bit. And we're gonna get okay. everybody, get everybody the time they need. So that, that was just really strong in terms of the connection between local ecosystems, your historical and cultural mythologies and biotechnology. You did a beautiful layout of how these three things intersect. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next speaker is gonna be Manisha Mohan. Mohan. Uh, Manisha is a founder and CEO of TELUS Technologies and is an alumni from the MIT Media Lab. Her research interests include wearable technology for safety and security and biomaterial science for wearables. Her work lives at the intersection of social issues, engineering with a specific focus on technologies that can create positive impact in people's lives and the environment. Her talk is titled Mortal Art. Thank you, Manisha, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, everyone. It's super interesting panel and super interesting uh, questions. Um, I'm honored to be here. Um, a very good morning, afternoon, and evening uh, to everyone joining from across the world. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, I'm Manisha. Um, I work at the intersection of materials and wearable technologies. Um, I like to say that I'm exploring materials, but more on the front of plant-based materials. Um, and I love to play with them. So this is some of my work. Um, at TELUS, uh, we are trying to make uh, replacements for bioplastic and we play with um, 2D form factors and um, uh, super absorbent polymer. We've been doing some work in designing some hygromorphic channels as well. Um, and while I was doing more of that work, focusing on sustainability, I started asking some questions along the lines of, uh, who humans are, why do we create anything, what does it actually mean um, as we develop, create, and embark on this journey, uh, where, where does sustainability play a role, and what are we trying to leave behind on this earth? Again, this is an exploration work, so too many questions out there. It was um, in 2019 when, my, uh, when I lost my uh, father-in-law, and I started looking at all his belongings. Um, and we started to realize that everything he had was left for the people behind him. Um, but there were things which were his, which meant had a very deep meaning for him. And we were oblivious to any of those. Uh, we didn't have any idea. Uh, I, I began to realize that uh, what people leave behind is sometimes in the form of a heritage sometimes in the form of a legacy. Um, the meaning is so deep that we, we tend to question every day, what 
what brought this into the world? Who brought it? Why was it there with him? And sometimes it's, uh, it's also associated with a sense of burden as well in some situations when people leave. And um, as I was focusing a lot on sustainability, I started uh, to realize that uh, do people in their lifetime really think about their belongings as to a, a sustainable means or do they really want to give it back to the future? And um, at the very same time, I was work. I had an engagement um, at MIT um, at um, at a Syrian refugee camp in Azraq, and I again started questioning: What are we inheriting? Uh, what do we actually get from our ancestors? Is it in the form of uh, a, a heritage which we really want to take forward? And those questions again start posing more sustainability, more political uh, connotations to them. And I, I, was, I was forced to question um, the, the, the boundaries of our lives. And I realized that most of the work which people do in their lifetime, as it is given from one generation to an another, it, it can lead to also inheriting enemies, inheriting wars inheriting um, both good and the bad. And my talk here is mostly focusing and asking questions. Are we really inheriting inequalities in the future? Um, and are we giving that to our future generations? Um, as I do have very limited set of tools with me to express the confusion which I have in my head, um, and the questions I keep asking. I'm using my material science background to design artistic paints, sustainability related materials and canvases. And I make these forms of art, which where the canvas itself um, is meant to degrade and become a part of the earth again. As the company's name is TELUS, which means from the earth back to the earth. We are focusing on the sustainability aspect of the materials. And these canvases are meant to degrade during our lifetime and live no longer than the user or the owner of the uh, product. Um, as I was working on this project, I created this form of art, uh, which is created on a blank canvas um, with, as the owner ages, wrinkles, shrivels, so does the art form. Uh, the art gradually after shrinking and shriveling and going through the different seasons of life uh, starts dropping in this big puddle of water, which is a representation of this earth. And as it goes into the uh, bath, it starts disintegrating and giving away all its texture, colors and form. And then in the end, it leaves a blank canvas, blank canvas for the future so that every generation has the freedom and the ability to fight their own wars, create their own stories, and not be strangled by what we or our lives have given them. And they can be given an equal opportunity. Um, this is a paradox here. Um, this box is made up of um, uh, plant-based materials, which are meant to degrade, but it case encases a diamond ring. And I have this poem here for you all, which I would love to share, that diamonds are forever, but the humans are not. The things we make should last as long as we do and expire no sooner, no later. When I leave this world, what, I should, what should I leave behind? My wars, my victories, my failures, my loves, my fortunes, my mysteries are all burdens to you who remain. You are not bound to them. You have no responsibilities to resolve them. So I'll bring them with me, giving you a blank page to write your own story. I leave no trace. Take even my memory with me. My footsteps erode by the waves of time. As soon for you who come after to walk a new path along shores clean and clear forever. Thank you, and I hope um, we can give a better future to our to our generations to come, without burdening them. Thanks.
Oh my goodness, that was beautiful, Manisha. I have tears in my eyes. Um, I'm thinking of this phrase that Marietta said in her talk of lingering in liminality this morning. And that certainly is the sensibility I get with what you're doing. So, so, so beautiful. Um, thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. We are Okay, we've got to decide what to do here. We're at the end of our time for Q&A, but we have a 10 minute break afterwards. So what I'm going to suggest is the next panel, Eduardo's panel, you guys get set to go. You be ready to jump in because um, if, if people need to take a break, go ahead and take a break now. But during the break, I would like to at least have time for one or two questions from these three wonderful speakers here. Um, so let's let's do that quickly. Who has a question for any one of the three speakers that just spoke? Such such an amazing um, set of, of talks, which all are interwoven in terms of their theme. Let me see if I can see everybody. Let's see, Patricia is clapping. Does anybody have a question they would like to answer? Ask. Any comments? Barbara, Barbara, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I have a hi. question about the, um, the lecture relating utopia to somehow biofabricated material coming through. So mm -hmm. I that, noticed that, Katie. that uh, yeah. yeah, Katie, uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation. I was really impressed. And uh, my question is about uh, the aesthetic because I'm noticing that uh, the more uh, biofabricated material and biodesign come closer to the market, the more the aesthetic of uh, uh, the inner organism is hid away or even uh, the organism mm, is subjected to some sort of camouflage to other uh, non-living materials like uh, some mycelium, uh, um, insulating panel that you showed uh, looks like plastic almost. So also on an aesthetic point of view, do you think that uh, this utopia is still maintained or uh, it's just uh, our awareness about the material that will bring uh, a utopia real in the future? Uh, thank you for that question. That's a really fascinating point. Um, my sense in talking to a lot of designers is that the aesthetic is fundamental to achieving the social goal of these objects, especially when it comes to the ephemerality or um, I, I've heard uh, the, the, the sense that these things are not going to be as perfect, as shiny, as clear, as precise, um, and that there needs to be a change of understanding of what's acceptable in our material world. That, that seems to be a really big theme in a lot of the people I've been speaking to. Um, so I think as if, if we go closer to a utopian future, that's going to be um, one of the key themes in terms of how do, um, how do you educate a changing aesthetic appreciation for objects? Let's see, Katie, uh, where are we? Does anybody else have a question that they would like to ask? If not, why don't we go ahead and take a break and um, uh, do some stretches and get ready to move on to the next panel. The next panel will queue up at, uh, I think what time it is there, 3.45. Three, yeah, 3.45, right? Is that when we're gonna start, Andy? It is 3.45 gotcha. ET time. All right. All right. And our next panel up is Eduardo will be the moderator for that panel. Uh, thank you all on these last panels and the two introductory talks. These were just really, really wonderful. Maybe we can give a clap for everybody that was, that was part of these, these panels. Thank you so much. And take a break. Come back at um, 45 after the hour. Hello everyone, thank you for joining. This is the second panel that we have for today and it is called Material Bioperformatics and it is inside the theme of livingness. So we just had a great panel 
fun and recycle and utopia and death and it was amazing and now we are moving to this universe in the realm of bio materials and bioperformatics slash architecture and more related stuff so for this panel we have as speakers barbara polini from the Polytechnic University of Milan in Italy, Professor Caroline Jones from the MIT, Cinza Ferrari from CSM in London, and Christopher Maurer from the Red House Studio in the United States. And we will be starting with uh, Barbara Polini. And let me quickly introduce Barbara. She is passionate about biodesign and she's a materials, a biomaterials researcher. She has a background in industrial design and she's affiliated with Politecnico di Milano in Italy. Thank you for being with us today, Barbara. Shall I share my time. screen? Perfect. Okay, let me know if you hear me and see me well. Yes, I hear you well, and we're seeing your slides. Cool. Okay, perfect. Um, well, it, it's a real pleasure to be part of Bio Summit. It's my first time, so I'm really, I'm really excited to be here. I'm presenting today one research line behind the, the big ad of my PhD overall research about biofabricated materials and sustainability in design. And today in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, the, um, the relationship that can occur among inert material and alive material. Um, mostly because, um, as you may have noticed, in biodesign, uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm for livingness and living materials. But actually, inert materials are fundamental for support livingness. And uh, we can also say that there is no clear distinction among uh, inert and living material around our environment. So I was uh, really interested in the role that inert material can play in supporting life. I started um, so digging more into material properties that can be life enabler. And bioreceptivity is, is one of these. It has been uh, uh, defined as the aptitude of a material uh, to be colonized by one or several groups of living organisms by Gilead in 1995. Um, actually, until the late 60s, bio, uh, it was associated with biodeterioration or biodegradation with a negative uh, connotation, let's say. But uh, the work of the lead helped uh, in reconsidering also positive uh, features about, uh, about this phenomena. So, for example, he said that uh, negative or positive connotation change accordingly to the type of construction, to the place, and to the person studying the phenomenon. Uh, in architecture, this phenomena uh, is starting to be considered with positive feature. And actually, uh, some scholars are starting to speak about bioreceptive design in architecture by meaning um, a phenomenon that can change the environmental and biological integrated performativity of an architecture. But uh, during my case studies collection within the overall uh, PhD research, I noticed that many cases uh, of biodesign and biofabricated materials stood out for the possibility of being associated with the original Gilead definition of bioreceptivity. So a research question emerged if it was possible to widen the concept of bioreceptivity, not only for architecture, but also to other and many other fields of design. And I was wondering if I could enlarge the definition arriving to talk about bioreceptive design whenever a material or an artifact is intentionally designed to be colonized by life forms. So I ran a little um, study with the, the case studies that were responding to this widened definition of bioreceptive design. Uh, I collected around uh, 20, 25 case studies, but they are growing as I go on with the research. And I start to analyze them based on seven fundamental aspects, which I'm quickly going to 
share with you. So the type of organism, I realized that responding to this uh, description, we, not, we, we don't have just uh, the um, typical organism from, from biofabrication like mycelium or algae or bacteria. For example, I found uh, ducks in also uh, present in, in, in my case studies. And well, the, on, on almost 20 case studies, I had 10 different organisms tested in this perspective. The environment is still mainly referring to urban areas because a lot of these uh, interesting studies and material development into bioreceptivity are related to, to architecture still, and they also were in, inside my study. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, there are many case studies in which the designer researched uh, working directly on the material composition. So, for example, Marlene Wissot in these case studies used amphite clay, natural binders and wood to create uh, some sort of welcoming hostel for insects, just um, uh, with a critical approach in a, in a, in a form of a, of a seat for a human, but it's totally intended just as a shelter for uh, wild pollinators. The application of these uh, bioreceptive materials and projects worldwide, but uh, emerged the two categories that were very interesting also for this conference, which were biorestoration and more the human environments. So, for example, these, uh, these uh, case studies from Alex Gold is meant to uh, restore the, the reef, the coral, the, coral, the coral reef, sorry, and uh, bioreceptive design being colonized by organism can really help uh, uh, solve problem in biodiversity incrementation or, uh, uh, yeah, the polluting. Uh, thanks to biofilm, for example, or thanks to marine life. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there are both speculative and more uh, uh, feasible case studies, but even the more uh, speculative project at the material level are very feasible because they need to sustain the life form they are designed to, to foster. So even though we will not wear, for example, a jacket of grass. Actually, the hydroponic textile developed was really functioning and really um, uh, supporting the life of, of, of these uh, seeds. Uh, a designer have different level of intervention. Um, it can work uh, just on the material composition, uh, as in this case, where the porosity of these uh, um, inert material with the, uh, was intended to help uh, in soil degradation and desertification areas so to have greener spots. Or uh, uh, a designer can also work on a surface design and here of course computational design and biofabrication, sorry, 3D printed, 3D printing also is very important because uh, uh, Biocolonization is mostly happening uh, also on a surface level. So uh, these are two important aspects to consider. Or of course, it can, it can, he, he or she can work on the old system of design. So considering uh, both the material, uh, the shape and the texture uh, have to, to be bioreceptive. I was able to um, yeah, define a procedural thinking to help designer um, tackle bioreceptive material and design artifact. Uh, but I started from what I found in literature, so that biological colonization is influenced by the intrinsic material properties, the environmental parameters, and the microclimatic parameters. At this point, uh, I develop this uh, methodology in which a designer is supposed to know very well how his or uh, what, which are the requirements of the organism is trying to foster. And I would also say, which is the life intention or life goals of the organism. He also, he or she needs to know the environmental parameters and the design of the material 
need to find the perfect correspondences of bioreceptivity to allow the organism to be alive no matter which environment he is in. Of course, these correspondences need also to match the microclimatic parameters of the installation site. Um, I'm going to conclude by saying that most of all, bioreceptive design is about relation. And here I want to quote uh, the words that Studio Sidiana used to describe their, uh, their work saying that materials and forms can act as a physical grammar of relationship among different species. And this brings me to the uh, final goal of my, of my PhD, uh, which big umbrella, uh, let's say, under which I'm putting all my research lines is uh, uh, about healing materialities, meaning all those material scenarios when we have uh, regenerative processes. And here I'm both including living materials as mycelium and uh, everything that we can see in the fabulous uh, biodesign world, but also life enabling material like the bioreceptive one, because both are at this final intent to, to support life. So I thank you very much for your time and attention. And if you want to know more, you can look at uh, healingmateriality.design for uh, what I'm sharing there. Wow, Barbara, that was just so inspiring. And uh, I gotta say it is like, I think that's the way to go in terms of paradigm shifting, you know, from uh, like anthropocentric, men-centered, human-centered design towards like biosphere-driven design. I think that's definitely the way to go, yeah. Thank you. So interesting. So, uh, our next speaker, and I'm going to quickly introduce her, is Professor Caroline Jones, and you should be seeing her picture here in the slide. Professor Jones is trained in visual studies and art history at Harvard. She graduated uh, at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York before doing her PhD at Stanford University, and she's going to be talking to us about variants. Thank you so much, Professor Caroline, for joining us today. Thank you, Eduardo. I'm going to share my screen. Tell me if there are any problems with that. Can everybody see that? Yes, I'm Great. seeing it. So I'll start presentation mode. And please just tell me when there's time, you know? Like, I'm, I'm not sure I'll be able to see the chat. I'll pop up when you have a minute left. OK, great. I'm going to hide the floating meeting controls so you can Get a little more image. So um, in reference to Ianot, I want to acknowledge that being at MIT, I'm here on the traditional lands of many, many people, many different language groups, uh, some of them whose names are already lost through that very history of colonization. I also want to point out that MIT benefited from land grabs in California from completely other Native people and those lands were sold to benefit my university. So my own work um, that I'm talking about today is part of the work of restoration, not only of, of you know, these people's lands, but also the restoration to an indigenous epistemology of relation, which has been very, very important to me. And I've really enjoyed hearing those aspects of the presentation so far. So I'm obsessed with um, let's see, I somehow need to, I'm curious about why my slides are not advancing. Oh, maybe now they are. Okay, I see, I just have to use a different cursor. So I'm obsessed with symbiosis, and the tale I have to tell you today about virions is engaged with this research that I'm doing. Symbiosis is not only the idea of with living at the level of, say, a pond, but it's at the level of the cell, which, of course, from Lynn Margulis's 1967 uh, syncretic theory reminds us that endosymbiosis was an ancient merging of archaeal bacteria that gave us the mitochondria, et cetera, et cetera. Symbiosis is also part of the biosphere. It's also part of Lovelock's and Margulis's theory of Gaia, so I was happy to hear Lovelock referenced earlier. 
Symbiosis is the core of an exhibition I'm preparing for the fall of 2022 called Symbionts, using the work of amazing contemporary artists to help us change our paradigm from what has been referred to earlier today as the Darwinian paradigm. We can also castigate it as the Cartesian paradigm, the Newtonian paradigm, <laughs> there are many names for it. But the point is the fiction of the individual is a fiction. Uh, this exhibition comes with a polemic. Symbio is obviously with living. The polemic is called symbiontics. The ontic is a philosophical category that means that which is. Symbiosis as that which is. So symbiontics is a polemic that asks that the precautionary principle that we think of um, should be extended to the more than human and the ecosystemic. It recommends a posture of humility for symbio. I want you to think about how few organisms will grow in vitro because they've been stripped from their codependent arising in an ecosystem. Symbiontics critiques above all the posture of the individual via the manifest entanglement, social and evolutionary of life forms in the biosphere. And here I turn to the inspiration of artists who have taught me so much about this. The metaphoric possibilities of collaborating with the social amoeba are in many artists' work, but here I was struck by the artist Yena Sutla, who did a performance piece called Extremophile, quoting someone I recognized as the philosopher Donna Haraway. To become a one, you must be a many. Sutla's work includes sculptures that have the Cicerum uh, polycephalum slime mold, but also performances in which she herself acknowledges her status as a holobiont, as part of a complex genomic co collective that is part of the symbiotic way of being. Sutla's work um, shows up in orgs, which is referring both to organizational charts, to the mandala driven, um, drawn by the mycelial expert in Japan, Minakata Kumugusu, and of course, um, the various sculptures in which he engages the work of serum type slime molds. For those of you who aren't aware of this enchanting creature, it's been used to model the collective intelligence of something like the subway, um, you know, the, the Tokyo subway system. Uh, this little video shows how these separate entities, these separate cells, chemi chemically organize themselves under conditions of duress, to come together um, into a, a kind of a fruiting body. It was long thought that these were connected to the fungi. We now know them to be closer to the animal kingdom. They come together in a fruiting body that becomes a motile kind of worm uh, that goes to a place to come up as a stem and become a, a, a fruiting body full of spores. Thank you, Andy, five minutes. Going to the next slide, I want to talk about virions specifically, which are very different from the um, single cell organisms of the Caesarum polycephalum or the Diplostilids. Virions are sometimes not even thought of as alive. When I, re when I researched this piece that I wrote out of a certain kind of anguish um, in the COVID um, pandemic isolation, I became quite entranced with the understanding from scientists about the ecological and environmental role of virions. The ecological virus, mutualistic viruses, and the heteronomy of life. I want you to talk with scientists about virions from a long-term ecological perspective Virions thrive in monocultures. They curb monocultures, in fact, and increase biodiversity. Many of these non-living agents continue to play crucial roles in habilitating, shaping, and pruning various forms of over-arrogant, over-dominant life. Uh, speaking of the human here. So we often see models like this. These are confabulated. They're not in their ecological setting. This is what virions look like under cryotomography, where we might see the rather fascinatingly structural form of the viral capsid, this kind of hexagonal capsid form. Um, they are bacteriophages, they are even virophages, they will eat other virions, and many of you know all about this, having worked with these materials. Virus-like capsids show up in mammalian brains. 
We need to question how their role evolutionary has contributed to our own species and to the species we revere. Your synbio tools are indebted to viral lysing capacities. The syncytium is what I want to briefly speak about, and this relates directly to Ianot's talk, because the syncytium is what gives us the mammalian placenta. Incorporation of viral gene sequences allow us to create this organ that fools the mother and tricks her immune system into retaining this foreign fetus and not rejecting it as an alien creature. So the syncytium is an incredibly important part of many forms of life, including the electrical pulsing capacities of the glass sponge. Thanks, Andy. The syncytium shows up in heart tissue. The syncytium and the lysing capacities of virions are crucial to our forms of life. And I want you to look at this cryotomography on the left of virions in situ and think about the inspiration of the virion as a kind of maybe a certain kind of a biologic, biological or biotically um, viable machine. And the inspiration I'm ending with is that for the bioartist Anika Yi, who has switched slightly towards the machinic phylum in her recent Kate Turpin Hall installation, in which what she calls aerobes look uncannily like our biotic machinic friends, the virion. Thank you. Wow. Uh, we certainly owe them so much, even more than I thought. <laughs> Isn't it crazy to think that like life as we know it probably wouldn't be here without viruses, right? Thank you so much, Professor. That was very interesting. Let's um, move forward and let me present our next speaker, who is Chinzia Hi. Ferrari. So we're now gonna be uh, listening to Chinzia's talk. Chinzia is an Italian design researcher. She has a background in interior design by Politecnico di Milano, and she explores bio-inspired systems that have the potential to dissolve the boundaries between natural, human, and digital worlds. Thank you so much for being here, Cinzia. Thank you very much for introducing me, um, and nice to meet you, everyone. It's such an honor um, to be here. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen. There you go. Okay. All right, so um, um, I'm going to present you my project Siano Fabrica, which is uh, my master's thesis project from the master in biodesign um, in St. John's and Martins. Um, so I started by thinking how, how we will make things in the future. Um, and, uh, and this project is an investigation on cyanobacteria biomineralization as a novel biofabrication method. But I'm going to start uh, by uh, introducing the co-designers of this project, which are cyanobacteria. Uh, they are photosynthetic single-cell organisms. They survived all five latest mass extinctions, and they can be found in almost all environments. They are also the first uh, photosynthetic organisms from which oxygen was uh, originated. But um, cyanobacteria biomineralization is a um, metabolic reaction. So the absorption of CO2 during photosynthesis causes changes in the uh, chemical composition of the water surrounding the bacteria. And this results in mineral precipitation. So these minerals bond uh, with sediments and polymers forming strong composites. The Geological significance of uh, calcification is immense, and uh, examples are uh, stromatolites, which are known to be world's oldest known fossils from 3.5 billion years ago. Um, therefore, the first evidence of life on Earth. Uh, cyanobacteria bimineralization is though a relatively novel method, and uh, my project is inspired by this amazing research uh, from the University of Colorado Boulder, they demonstrated how to create strong bricks by inoculating uh, cyanobacteria with gelatin and sand. And because um, of the promising results, they, um, the process is now being explored for applications in the construction uh, industry. 
but uh, with my project, I wanted to initiate a new uh, investigation and conversation about uh, how to innovate uh, in, uh, in design um, and uh, against wasteful processes and what's considered good enough. So I decided to focus on a, a different output and uh, it's sunglasses. Um, so this choice um, combines my interest in uh, transparency and uh, uh, innovation in practices. So the sunglasses market is um, expected to constantly grow in the next years. <laughs> um, and therefore finding better ways of designing and making, uh, I believe it's a real need. And at the moment, uh, one good sustainable option is considered to be bioacetate, which comes from natural resources. but. Um, it still involves intense processes and raw material that gets transported from long distances and pigments obtained through water wasteful processes and are not so clear end of life. And uh, moreover, cyanobacteria offer good UV protection thanks to cytonamine, uh, which is a compound that is currently being researched for sunscreen applications. Um, and my project focused on developing a material for the frames, but this aspect also presents an interesting future potential for lenses too. So this very synthesized diagram um, shows the process to make biomineralized frames. It shows that it could be optimized to offset these emissions uh, since the bacteria is kept in constant growth, allowing photosynthesis to happen. There is no water wasted in the process as it is reintroduced in bioreactors where the bacteria grows. And the product is uh, designed to be remanufactured at the, at the end of the, uh, of the system. In fact, at the end of its life, uh, the frames can be destroyed and used as a substrate for new production. Um, so during this past one year and a half, I've been learning how to understand cyanobacterial growth and processes and analyze the result of my experiments. And this was all thanks to supervision of a team of amazing scientists, uh, without whom none of uh, this would have been possible as my background is, is design. So this was quite a, um, a challenge, an amazing challenge. Um, once I found the right um, growth media for, for my bacteria, and, uh, and this took, took some time, um, I proceeded with biomineralization experiments. So the first objective for me was to repeat uh, the process from the boulder research. And uh, with the result, I, I could already see difference between the sample with bacteria and without. So as you can see, uh, the sample without the bacteria lost materiality and I couldn't remove it from the, from the petri dish. I then decided to expand the research from Boulder by working with three different uh, bacterial strains to demonstrate how the process could potentially be applied locally. Um, I would also like to underline how, thank you, um, how, how beautiful this, this bacteria uh, is. These are um, microscopic pictures that I took during my, my, my study and um, looking at them closely made me realize, made me fall in love even more with this project. Um, I then used also a scaffold that is made from uh, algae-derived hydrogels, uh, such as alg alginate and agar, and uh, ground shells, while the boulder team used um, gelatin and uh, uh, local sand. Then after established, uh, having established my process, um, I, it was fundamental for me to find measurable differences between a bacteria presence or not um, using different compounds. Um, so I've been going through experiments to compare the three strains, different inoculation times and weight changes while drying. And these are the results of the weight during the drying process. They confirm that uh, what we noticed visually before, in fact, the sample without the bacteria, the pink, uh, the pink line here, um, lost more weight more quickly and this compromised its final outcome. And the one with the bacteria was in fact uh, much uh, stronger. And um, then since April we also received a new amazing uh, microscope in our grow lab and this gave me the opportunity to observe the mineral sediments produced by the bacteria and the way that they are uh, binding and encapsulating the substrate. So here comparing the results of three different strains at the scale of 250 micrometers. Um, but at even a smaller scale, uh, I was finally able to see the details of these uh, amazing crystals that are invisible to the naked eye. 
Um, coming to the design development, um, it's important for me to say that the organism took a fundamental part in this system and definitely contributed to aesthetics. Um, they are in fact dictated by the way it binds the substrate, but um, the shape that I designed was also inspired by patterns of uh, these microscopic observations that I fell in love with. Um, so this is the result, which is a small collection of three frames each of them named after the organism uh, inside of them. Um, so the temples on the front are made by the biomineralized material. And uh, for filler hinges, I use the real sunglasses ones, but it would be interesting to um, look into extrusion. Um, this is what I was talking about uh, in terms of UV protection. Uh, I um, did a spectrum analysis of the plates of my growing bacteria, and this showed a high shield against the blue, um, the blue light. Um, which are the ones coming from our screens. Uh, so this is SIN702, um, which is co-created with my cyanobacteria. And um, the, despite this uniformity in the process, the success in this outcome depends on the materialization coming from a living system and not two are, um, are ever alike. This is also very visible in the patterns of these days that I created. Um, it's important for me to say that to create this base, I used as a substrate um, the um, pieces from old experiments to show how this material can be uh, remanufactured uh, endlessly. They also, um, stone bacteria also produce a bright blue pigment called phycocyanin, which is used in the, in the food industry. Um, and I experimented uh, with as a possible paint, uh, mixing it with just sodium alginate uh, in order, and I obtained a different uh, palette of, um, of look. Um, I then decided that I would use um, the natural color of the, of the frame instead of painting it all, because I actually liked this very uh, rock um, aesthetics. Um, and this is the microscopic picture of my frame that shows uh, this biomineralization and these bonding crystals um, at, um, at a very small scale. <laughs> um, so then here, finally, I would like to outline the research needed to further develop this biofabrication process, which uh, needs an enhanced mineral precipitation through understanding of this uh, process uh, that promote calcification, um, an alternative to the centrifuge that uh, consumes energy and that makes this process less accessible uh, around the world, and also uh, the possibility of exploring extrusion. Um, finally, one thing that I actually uh, started to uh, explore more after the end of this project is that um, other than materiability, um, in July, at the symposium which we presented our master's work, I was asked a question uh, that made me realize an aspect I haven't considered during my research. And it was, is it respectful to let this bacteria die at the end of the process? And why, why don't we keep it alive? So this is um, a direction that I'm trying to take forward. And if, it's, if a product is created in collaboration with a living system and is potentially kept alive, how, how the whole experience change? How our um, way of designing, producing and communicating uh, change? How, how, what can it teach us uh, about uh, the objects that we own and um, how we take care of them? So, this is um, a question that I'm making to you all, and um, I'm trying to um, still um, understand. Well, um, that's it. Well, I would also really, really, really like to thank uh, everyone who helped me and collaborated for this project because it was a real challenge and their support was um, immense. Thank you. Well, thank you. You know, I loved that you recognized the co-designers the cyanobacteria as co-designers of the process. And I think we should definitely adopt that as like good practice at the beginning of biodesign presentations, because it's that's about it, right? It doesn't make any sense to talk about non-human and not acknowledging them in the end of the process. Wow, thank you, Chinzia, very, very much. And right now we have our next speaker who is Christopher Morer. So so you know who Christopher is. He is an architect with, wow, a lot of experience in different projects and, and in studios and cities in the world. And he's the founder and the principal of Red House Studio. And Christopher is going to be talking about bioarchitecture on and off the planet. Thank you so much for joining us today, Christopher.
Hey, Christopher, can you turn your video on also so we can see you? It'd be great to see you talk. There, yes, that, there he is. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, honored to be here. Um, the title of today's talk is Bioarchitecture on and Off Planet. Um, I'll, I'll get into that in a second, but yeah, we're going to be discussing three projects that my studio is working on that use bioarchitecture. And as we're alluding to here, uh, at least one of them are going to be off planet. So, um, since we have such a, a illustrious uh, group today and, and uh, folks talking about bio design and bio materials, I wanted to run something by you all. Um, so we, we actually started using or we started out using the word, word biomaterials, but found that was kind of problematic uh, because when you look that up, you see that that is usually associated with medical devices. So these are materials that work well with biology. Um, where I'm talking about something different, um, we're actually talking about uh, or, um, materials that utilize the growth of organisms in their manufacture. Um, so what we did and what, what I would uh, suggest we all um, discuss at some point is to come up with a new word and we decided to just take out one of the syllables and go with biotereals. Um, and again, I'll define that as anything that uses the growth of organisms in the manufacture. Um, so things that it is not are bio-based materials like wood or bamboo or adobe, or if you go back uh, far enough in the you know, geological scale, uh, plastic is made from um, you know, prehistoric organisms. So that's actually bio-based as well. Um, what we're talking about, again, is something that uses the growth of organisms in its manufacture. So that includes things like uh, bacterial, uh, materials like uh, microbial induced uh, calcite precipitation that make things like uh, stones and bricks and combine sand together. There's a company called Biomason that's making bricks using this process uh, of, of fungal materials or mycotexture or mycoterials is, is uh, we sometimes call them that use the root like branching high fee of uh, my, uh, fungal mycelium to make things um, uh, like things from Ecovative or any of their licensees, or uh, as we just saw uh, where we're using, uh, folks are using uh, al algaes to create uh, materials as well for, for plastic substitutes. Um, you actually grow the organism to make the material that you're, you're talking about. My favorite, uh, the one that we utilize the most is um, mycotexture. Um, and uh, that again, uses the root-like branching hyphae of fungus. Um, my, called mycelium, and uh, yeah, I don't need to go into that too much because we've heard a lot about that today, uh, this morning from uh, Juliana at the uh, Fungi Foundation, and we just saw a project from the, the, the Locust Foundation as well, um, where you, you can take the, the mycelium, which is the, again the vegetative organ, organism of fungus, uh, and make things out of it. And a lot of folks, you know, since it is root like branching hyphae, a lot of people think it's the roots of a mushroom, but that's really the wrong way to look at it. The mycelium is the organism and the mushroom is the fruit. So we, where you see the, the picture on the right comparing organism to organism, you know, the oranges are the same as the, uh, the, the mushroom and the tree is the same as the, the mycelium. So, I, I, you know, I make that distinction for a lot of reasons. One is because we're building with this and we would never build with something that could be food otherwise because we would want that food to go to other organisms to eat. Uh, the other reason is uh, uh, it's um, uh, it's a little bit harder to understand why you would build something out of fruit. Like if you say you make a chest of drawers out of cherry, uh, obviously I'm talking about cherry wood, not, not the, the fruit cherry. So we try and make this distinction to all the folks we talk about when we get pressed. And then inevitably, they always say, oh, NASA's building um, habitats out of mushrooms. And, and that's, that's not correct. We're, we're talking about making things out of mycelium. Uh, so here, here's the process. You basically take that mycelium, you can combine it with any kind of organic substrate, um, and you can put it into a formwork to make things. So you can see there in that middle, um, here's a mushroom cultivator actually growing mushrooms. You could actually harvest that mushroom and then take the waste material from that uh, to make your building material. So th this, this can have a... A, a lot of benefits when you use this. And I mentioned that we're gonna talk about three projects and here's one project where it actually, we utilize both uh, sources of that. So we take what's called the Acacia millifera or the encroacher bush in Namibia. Um, this is a project we're working with MIT and Standard Bank Group, which is Africa's largest bank. 
They have a problem in Namibia with this encroacher bush that is choking out natural grasslands, which are um, you know important for wildlife refuge, and uh, uh, are unfortunately choking the, the water out of uh, the ecosystem there. We can take that bush, we can chip it up, we can turn it into substrate for growing mushrooms, uh, have mushrooms for food security, and then the waste material for that is what's actually used for making um, building materials. And here you can see the process along the bottom. We have a few animations here. Um, you can see our friend Pendapala, who's, who's uh, demonstrating an impact test in slow motion between our block on the right and concrete on the left and the concrete did not do very well in this, this impact. It's very unscientific test, but you get the point. Um, we're also using uh, a, a inflatable technology in this, and this is something we derived from our, our NASA project as well, uh, where we're um, using reusable formwork over and over to, to build an arch structure. Um, uh, and so I'll go on to the next project which is our biocycler. And this uh, takes, uh, remediates and recycles construction and demolition waste. So there's over 500 million tons of demolition that enter landfills each year in the US and buildings are responsible for 40% of carbon emissions. Many building materials are dangerous in their production use and life. Um, and so the solution for that we show here at the bottom is actually to take that construction waste and then uh, bind it together using cultured bio binders that can remediate that as well. Um, I'm showing some, some images here on the right where we did um, some TEM imagery of the, the material that was uh, purposely uh, tainted with lead paint um, and the lead that was actually bioaccumulated into the, uh, the cell wall of the mycelium, um, pr protecting it from becoming biologically available. Um, and then we did what's called the toxic, toxic character resistance uh, leaching procedure, which uh, actually shows how much of that lead would leach into groundwater after uh, th this process and it, um, it virtually reduced it to zero, the, the amount of lead that, that would normally uh, in landfills go into to leach into groundwater. Um, this this uh, procedure actually uh, protected it from becoming biologically available and getting into the groundwater system. Here you can see some images of this. So again, we're taking uh, waste material from a demolition site, um, chopping it into smaller bits and then we're, uh, re-establishing those bits together. The sawdust that was made during this process, we uh, inoculated with mycelium and turned that into these artistic uh, interior walls for our uh, first recycled or biocycled uh, habitat. It's actually a, a habitat for bees. It's a bee barn <laughs> at a farm where they're uh, producing honey. Um, so it's a very small building, but it has a very high occupancy. We have about 500 thousand uh, beings in this building right now so it's uh <laughs> and uh, what we did is we took the mycelium panels and since we're using this to again remediate it against metals uh what we have here is there's iron filings that are sprinkled onto the uh, mycelium panels that create these images of uh, inspirational refugees because uh, this was for a project for a group called the refugee response here in cleveland that assists uh, folks in finding um, uh, refugees and finding good jobs here in Cleveland. So our last project that I'm going to talk about, um, this is uh, a project we're doing for NASA through the NIAC program with Dr. Lynn Rothschild, who's a, a PI and she's a astrobiologist at NASA Ames. Um, if you're NASA, you have a few options for getting materials to uh, off planet for, for building. You can be like the turtle and you can take it with you, which uh, buys reliability, but it costs you energy or you can be like the bird and actually make your home when you get to destination. We propose a middle of the road uh, option where you actually take uh, a seeded bag full of microbes and mycelium um, and you inflate that at destination and use in situ resources like water, carbon dioxide and nitrogen to um, nutrate the uh, organisms. And you can see in this uh, animation on the right, we're growing cyanobacteria. Um, the organism from the last panel, and uh, then that gets consumed by mycelium, mycelium to make these uh, composite materials. So um, in the top, you can see the, the building growing. On the bottom here, you actually see uh, the furniture and the inside that can be grown using the same methods. Um, in addition to having superior mechanical characteristics, we also have the ability to use the uh, organism's bioperform formative features to block from radiation. And we do that by creating uh, melanin, which is a, a biocomposite that 
uh, protects from space radiation, as well as lipids, which has a very high electron density. Um, so in closing, I'll just uh, mention that all, all three of these projects, and we have a fourth that actually uses harmful algal blooms to make materials, uh, we're always looking at waste resources that can be recycled, remediated into uh, new building materials. And the, the reason we can do that is because we can use the bioperformative aspects of living organisms. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christopher. Uh, wow, I love that it started by rethinking the term itself, right? the word like going back to semantics sometimes that's that's so important it was great um we now have a few minutes for questions then and Andy is gonna keep helping us with timekeeping but please if you have any questions for any of our four panelists or Chris first daughter I'm assuming who wants to participate also that's that's my uh, uh PR manager <laughs> that's great <laughs> So you're in good hands, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Definitely in good hands. Great. I see we had a question here in the chat by Nathalie. Could it make also toxic compounds available? Could it be a possible danger? And she posted a question during your talk, Christopher. Nathalie, would you like to, to add to your question? I don't know if, you're, if, you, if you can unmute, but this is the... Uh, the question that we have in the chat, but other than the chat, I don't know if anyone has any other question. Oh, Natalie. I think she has to be unmuted, right, by the, by you the host. You cannot unmute yourself, Natalie. I see you, Natalie. <laughs> yeah, she cannot unmute. Oh, I hey. guess now. Yes, here there you go. go. No, it, it's just a question because uh, if we do put some uh, uh, compounds available, it can be food, but it can be also toxic compounds that can um, become available and maybe more toxic. It's just a question. Uh, so I, I don't know if you're talking about the, the biocycler, but in that process, uh, the fungi are actually able to do things like break down uh, petrochemicals, BAHs, things like that, that are, that are put into building materials. They're able to break those down into safer, smaller chains, of, you know, um, polymer yes, chains. But they can also uh, accumulate radioactive compounds. I'm sorry? Uh, they can also accumulate, for example, radioactive right. compounds. Right, right. So, so fruiting bodies can... tend to uh, accumulate um, um, the, the compounds that you're talking about. So they'll accumulate things like heavy metals. So in that process, in the biocycle, we're not pr producing mushrooms. That one is uh, strictly remediating and turning into building materials. Um, so there are a few things that we do there. Uh, so as I mentioned, the fungi can break down the petrochemicals and things like that, that are long chains get broken down into smaller chains. When we have things that are, are like uh, heavy metals and things like that, that are atomically toxic, you know, that they, they aren't part of a large, um, polymer chain, we do the opposite. So it's, it's, it chelates the, the material. So uh, we use things like uh, biochar and um, the mycelium itself can actually um, take those, uh, th those um, uh, heavy metals and, and put them into uh, biologically unavailable um, um, areas or, or uh, attach them to other uh, molecule chains that make them uh, not available. So that's that's uh, we're looking at that um, using microscopy and seeing where the heavy metals are ending up. But we're also um, doing things like the leaching procedure that I mentioned that that is showing that these uh, toxins are locked away in such a way that they you know after hundreds of years of, um, of landfill they are still not becoming available uh, biologically available. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a comment that I wanted to say is that I, I just think this idea of using waste resources as building materials, and I think you even talked about that when we were discussing it about the, the rays in outer space as, as that are harmful actually being like what you'd use as, as a generative power. And I think that that's just a fundamental paradigm shift in terms of how we think about building. I'm also relating it a bit to Manisha's talk 
uh, about um, designing with having what's left behind in mind. Um, and the other part connected to that is your use of, of this mushrooms, the mushroom fruiting body as food, and then the waste material as building. I've, I've really never heard of anybody doing that before you told us about it. So really fascinating ideas in this talk. Definitely. Cool. We do have another question in the chat from Naomi. Um, I hear about the future of breathable buildings. Do you wanna, uh, by the way, <laughs> ask your question, Naomi? I see you're there. And I also think you have to be unmuted. Okay. There yeah. you go. Um, yeah, I'm actually <clears throat> very fascinated about the future of architecture. So I really appreciated the um, talk. It was really helpful. And uh, I have wanted to work with the mycelium and myself. So um, as an artist and scientist, um, I was, my question was, uh, I've heard about I'll just read the question <laughs> about the future of breathable buildings uh, and uh, that are organic and respond to the environment. And um, I was just wondering if you've ever, what do you have to say to that? Or have you used some, any extension of that? How much of it is actually actively used? I also have a second question after that too, but it, and, and maybe I'll ask at the same time. Um, Dixon Despommier, uh, I, I know myself friend of mine who's worked on uh, vertical farming and it's actually got, had me in, very, very interested in um, that sort of organic aspect of uh, the living urban, urban environment and its association to architecture. So um, thinking of the vertical farming in relationship to what you were talking about and also possibly in relationship to these breathable so-called organic buildings of the future um, what you 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 probably have a lot of thoughts on that so i'm very curious to know what you have to say uh yeah yeah so i, I should have show, shown this when uh panda was doing the impact test but this is uh one of the materials that, that we're working with um and since you can't touch it hopefully you can hear that um, it's pretty much like uh, it has the consistency and the density of, of wood. Um, so it's uh, building with this is similar to building with uh, timber, um, you know, softwoods, things like that. And the way that we form it into blocks and that they become a massive bit of um, uh, material, whereas normally, you know, with wood, you'll build with two by fours and they'll be really thin and they'll be stick and, you know, they'll, 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 they'll burn real easy. Um, and then you have to coat them with things like uh, expanded polystyrene to make them, you know, the insulation value go up. The, we purposely make it massive because it is a waste material. We can afford to do that. Um, it, and it's also massive because it becomes structural, it becomes insulative. And since it's a carbon store, um, you can actually, uh, the more mass you put into the building, um, the more um, carbon you're, you're storing away for decades, possibly, you know, uh, centuries, um, mm -hmm. ho however long the building is used. Uh, the material is very hygroscopic, so it can, it can um, absorb uh, humidity through the air and then release it. Um, and it also, you know, does have that breathable nature to it. You do have to protect it from, from the elements, but it, but it is something where uh, we, we don't go the same route that a lot of um, green building uh, technologies do where they just throw as much uh, EPS uh, insulation on it as, as, as much as possible so that you get the energy efficiency. You can throw mass at this and the reason you can throw mass at it is because it's a waste material. And uh, in relationship to uh, <clears throat> the actual vertical farming and possible connection between uh, growth and production that's produced, uh, as an extension of it going back full circle into the cycle. I was wondering if you had any comments about that. I, as an artist, I think a little bit differently than architects and scientists yeah. and, uh, and probably a few jumps ahead of things. I actually did uh, years ago hear a lecture on it um, at the MoMA in New York uh, where there's an ar architectural company out of um, London, I believe which had a whole team of about uh, scientists, including astrophysicists, who uh, were portraying a very different future that we were looking, than we were looking at back then, and it was quite a few years ago. So now I'm sure that we, there's been much more written about it or, or talked about it. I'm wondering what your, um, if you've had any sort of interaction with that sort of 
those ideas? Yeah, so we would love this to, to be a living architecture right now. You know, the way that we make it, we actually bake bake it and uh, compact it so that, it, you know, this is a dead material once, once it goes through that process. But we're looking towards a future where it could be a living material. And with yeah. our project with NASA, um, that's one option where we can actually have them, since it doesn't need to be structural there, um, we can use this as an insulation and radiation protection. And uh, you can turn on and off the, the conditions for making the organism grow um, such that you can just let it go dormant for a number of years. But if you need to repair something, you can turn back on those mechanisms that create the environment for growth and you can have a self healing material. So that, you right. know, that's one bioperformative thing. Another bioperformative thing is it could have sensors in it that, that tell you about different characteristics in your environment. Um, thinking about probiotic architecture in the future, what if we had a living architecture that was around us that told us there is a uh, coronavirus that, that is about to you know, cause a, a, a pandemic uh, throughout the world and, and the living architecture starts attacking that pathogen before, before it comes a problem for us. Um, that's you know, the future I would see through you know, bioperformative features in architecture and that, you know, that's you know, step by step we, we may get there um, you know, in, in decades. Thank you. Yeah. Andy, you did have a question, right? Yeah, I have a question that's pretty much for all of the panelists, because I think there was something, you know, looking at each of these talks, there were, in every one of them, there was a little bit of data, there was a little bit of design, there was a little bit of art, and there was a little bit of engineering. And I was trained as a, a scientist and told that science and engineering is very different. And I teach in an art school now and art and design is very different. How much, where do you guys see yourself, all, all three of the speakers who are still here, sorting yourself out in between these lines of how much are you doing science in the lab? How much of it is engineering? How much of it is design? And how much of it is art? Just because it seems to just be free flowing between those. And how much, where do you place yourself on those spectrums? And that's for everyone, because I think each of you pre presented each of those. I don't know. I may start since I start uh, with the lecture. It's not an easy answer. I mean, uh, for, for me, my thread union is always uh, uh, sustainability and sustainable design. But in the topic I presented, I'm very much aware that uh, there is biology because I need to know the organism and uh, computational design and bio-inspiration or biomimicry to create the better surfaces, but also material design, because actually the biofilm is uh, also depending from the colors, from the pH, from uh, the rugosity of the material. So it's really a mixture of that. I, I'm pretty sure not calling it art, but uh, for the rest is uh, a bit of an entanglement. Yeah, this is such an amazing question. Uh, and, and I think it's like you said, it's a little bit of a free flow, um, my case. And it's, um, I also have to say for some moments during the master, it was a little bit of a struggle because um, we were supposed to be doing design and, and biology, but the, the thing is, I think you cannot control um, what is happening inside of you. So I think that in some moments you feel a little bit more scientist and you really want to focus uh, in the, in, we want to stay in the lab, you want to understand what's happening and you cannot do um, forced design in that moment. And then you wake up one day and you feel inspired and, and you have some creative ideas. And then I think it's, it's, it's about letting yourself go and flow between one and the other. And I also believe that what is interesting about all these um, mixing uh, fields is the fact that we all do it in a different way. Um, so speaking with, with scientists, it was interesting to see how we both so things in a different way. And I think that's enriching because then um, coming from a design background, um, I, I think of things and I see things in, the, in some scientific processes that uh, a scientist would not see, but at the same time, I would receive a feedback that actually um, then um, makes me go forward. And I think we, we both help each other. And um, so probably it's about how many different fields we have within us, but also how we all 
um, connect with others. So it's it's also outside of us, and that makes the world feel. That's why it's so amazing. I think. Yeah, I, I can just add as a you know architect, we're always working with people that are smarter than us. So uh, you know we we come up with high level designs and we you know make pictures and we we test things out, um, but. You know, we're always working with uh, structural engineers and MEP engineers, civil engineers, et cetera, to, to kind of do the calcs and, you know, uh, run the math. Um, with, with projects like this, yes, we are working with mycelium and we, we are makers at, at my studio. We grow, you know, probably hundreds of pounds of, of mycelium every, every week and turn it into stuff and a lot, most of the stuff we throw away. But... Uh, other stuff we send to the labs, uh, but you know our lab is nothing like uh, Lynn Rothschild looks lab at NASA Ames or Andreas Mershon's lab at uh, the Center for Bits and Atoms there at MIT. Um, so they're they're kind of the, the ones that are um, doing the spectroscopy and microscopy and, and the scientific studies. We we make things and, and we go, oh yeah, this one's pretty hard, so <laughs> let's let's send that one off and, and, and so. Uh, it's really uh, a, a different kind of collaboration. Instead of working with a structural engineer, we're working with an astrobiologist. Instead of working with an MEP engineer, we're working with the, you know, a physicist that just happens to uh, do everything else too. So, um, you know, it's, it's really about uh, creating the teams um, to make things like that and um, learning what you can from, from people that come from different backgrounds. So bringing those, those resources together and then Finally, it's the organisms too. So you kind of let them do what they want to do and uh, learn from that. Um, most of our projects are what we call bio-utilitarian, uh, but the one uh, for, for NASA that we described is, is almost the most biomimetic um, project that I can think of because we're actually talking about uh, something that grows itself. And we have you know cells and we have circulatory systems so we're really looking to nature and, and trying to see how can we get nutrients to the right place to enable this organism to actually grow. Um, in our project in Namibia, we look at it as something that can actually, uh, we, we make one building that can make a, two buildings and then those buildings make two buildings. So it's, it's kind of biomimetic in the sense that there's a cell division that happens there. And if you can think of that as a, on an exponential scale, um, and you're building using uh, uh, responsible methods that, that store carbon instead of create carbon, then you, you would hope that that exponential growth would actually uh, have a positive impact. We are going to have a talk, a quick talk by Gil Vicente, and I'll be quickly introducing him. Gil is a PhD in social anthropology, research fellow at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Tsukuba in Japan, postdoctoral researcher at the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, and the Department of Scientific and Technological Policy at the University of Campinas in Brazil. And Gil will be talking to us about bioartisans and scientific artisans. I already found the title very interesting. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today, Gil, and for agreeing to deliver this talk. We're very honored to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, I would like to share my presentations just a minute. All right, here we are. So, <clears throat> um, first of all, I'd like to um, to oh no, okay, to thanks to uh, Top SP is the Sao Paulo Research Foundation who found my research. All friends who participate in this research and Bio Club Tokyo. Icamp, Abiru, Onovo Lab, and many universities and friends. And Eduardo, uh, he, uh, he also participated in this research, giving me an interview. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for all and uh, for your kind, as always. Okay, so let's go. Well, in this opportunity, I would like to share and talk about my research with you. And this research uh, was about the do-it-yourself biology and do-it-yourself practice. And uh, I started uh, this research in Brazil and 
um, and uh, I went to Japan. No? Um, so, um, I what I want uh, what I want to say uh, today is that I propose briefly to say a little bit about do it yourself biology and do it yourself perhaps, and uh, how to define such thing. And I would like to speak about my field work from a perspective of ethnographic participation, uh, or how um, it's some kind of ethnographic and anthropological way to understand and to say about uh, how people think, and uh, in terms of science and uh, um, and in terms of in a practice and science of practice. And I intend to connect the following fields, uh, science, hackerspace, fab labs, and do it yourself um, practices and projects. And in conclusion, despite of difference of projects, productions, things, stuff, and so on. And the idea is that the notion of do it yourself side maker culture could be a synthesis. Uh, of science in the making. And of course, a special relationship between science and art, which appears to be very important uh, inside of the do-it-yourself movement. Okay, so, um, uh, the research started at academic laboratories in Brazil, hacker clubs, hacker space, fab labs, and uh, ateliers in Brazil, and uh, the research finished uh, with conversations with researchers, do it yourself, practitioners, and artists in Japan. And uh, I was interested to connect uh, the productions of do it yourself artists and scientists with, uh, or how we could connect these things with the humans. The main, the main point for me was. Uh, trying to figure out and try to understand how uh, all uh, the way of do the things could be connected. Um, and of course, to talk about processes of doing and making things as well. Um, well, uh, about the definitions, I think we have um, two ways of uh, think about do it yourself and uh, do it together. No? Um, and the first, the collaborative associative character of action toward a purpose and uh, a particular way of doing something no? that can comprehend many unpredictable ways of developing a project. And the basic notion here is that a way of doing is some kind of actualization in a myriad of virtual possibilities. And of course, the notion of design a project, project, or project in, in Japanese is something very important you know, for, the, uh, for those who I was uh, researching with. Okay, mm, the next. Uh, well, I went to many places. No? Oh, sorry. Some problem. Oh, no. I went to many places. Um, uh, something wrong is happening. Can you see? Can you see this? Uh, places, far labs, far labs. It's okay. All right. Can you listen? Sorry. Yes. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, uh, so, um, well, just to talk about the places and the spaces no? that was uh, researching. And, uh, well, all these places, do-it-yourself labs, citizen labs, fab labs, um, um, laboratories and so on. And uh, all these, all those, they, um, one very important point is present and is related with uh, their character of dry and wet. Né? 
or uh, in, in just to fix it, uh, the point is the presence or absence of liquids. Yeah? And wet labs or uh, wet laboratories are laboratories where chemicals, drugs, and biological matter and are tested and analyzed. And dry labs uh, are where computational or clean mathematical analysis or other dry activities can be done. This is a very important distinction between these spaces. And, um, okay, it's here, I'm sorry. And uh, the point is, uh, is this. So is related with dry and wet. Okay, let me share the next, uh, I, the next, one. Um, another characteristic of do it yourself laboratories as a way of uh, something related with the garage. Yeah? And uh, this is something is a very important uh, point. Yeah? And uh, have some kind of, uh, in some cases, is some kind of founding myth. Yeah? Uh, how much you can appear uh, your place uh, or show your place as a garage. And uh, this, you know, have some, is some kind of symbol that links the mythic past of computation to American dream of freedom. I think the relationship between the garage and labs and uh, do it yourself practices. And, uh, but in another sense, uh, we need to reflect that the garage is one element of uh, the North American culture of innovation. And uh, that this does not have the same function uh, out of this context. For example, in Brazil, uh, the spaces are related with kitchens. Uh, it's not exactly with the garage. And uh, in Japan, uh, the places or the labs looks like more like the functional laboratories instead of kitchens or instead of garages. And this is an important point inside of these uh, collectives, how they think about their own spaces. And um, to the end, the laboratory, in yeah, spite of difference, is something alive somehow. Here we can see uh, a few pictures of uh, laboratories um, and uh, a few tools, for example. Well, so um, I I had a chance to participate in experiments, microbiology experiments, uh, analysis, and uh, of course, and develop conversations with professionals of the most different layers and tracks. And uh, I just would like to say about few projects I saw the field work and uh, to and close this uh, presentation. So, um, well, there are many projects. I'm, I'm going to focus to uh, the projects of Japan in this time. And I hope to, to talk in the next uh, opportunity more about Brazil. Well, so about the Japan, um, I would like to talk about the Kintsugi, the artist Christina Stadtbauer. Uh, I had to, I had a chance to see her work uh, with Kintsugi. Kintsugi is a process to to connect broken parts of uh, traditional Japanese cups and uh, dishes, and uh, they use some kind of uh, gold material or some kind of um, metal material to do it in order to do it. But she developed a process to fix it using biological matter. And uh, this is such a beautiful thing because uh, the point is not to hide what is broken, but uh, to highlight the uniqueness and beauty of what are broken apart. 
And uh, so the point is how we can repair what is broken and how we can demonstrate these scars and cracks on the parts and how we can do repair together the things. So here we have a picture about her work. And uh, the next one is about Joy Tremel. And uh, I, he was a very um, important uh, person in this research because he opened many opportunities and many other researchers for me. So I'm very grateful to know him. And uh, I visit many times uh, the Tokyo, the Bio Club in Tokyo. And uh, he's uh, some kind of director there, or, and of course, the founded person. Huh? And uh, the, his project uh, related with a biopresence, or how we can merge the human and trees, uh, introducing the human characteristics into a plant uh, without changing the genes, are uh, very interesting to think about uh, the things about research. So I'm very grateful to meet him. I'm very grateful to talk to him and uh, he has a very strong um, relation with my uh, research. Um, well, Sebastian Kosioba, maybe uh, all you know him from the Binomica lab. Uh, he's a very interesting research, biotechnology research. And, uh, and, and uh, his projects about flowers and genetic modification of flowers touched me in a very special way. Uh, and I saw his presentations, keeping touching, talking, and uh, uh, it's important how uh, we can think about uh, all the things, how we can collect and uh, rebuild information about almost everything by genetic analysis. So for me, it was such an amazing thing to know his work. And uh, by the end, I just would like to share with uh, you the professor Hideo Iwasaki. And uh, he's a biologist and artist. Maybe you saw him as well, the George Fremel uh, in this track uh, today. And uh, his project, about these living stones or some kind of memorial for dead um, parts and dead uh, uh, matters, biological matters. And uh, he, uh, these art, and uh, this, uh, some kind of tomb for the dead artist and the dead, so I'm sorry, the dead uh, biological matter. And uh, it's seated in Ibaraki, Japan, this, um, uh, call it a prayer, some kind of monuments for uh, the matter that pass away. And, and of course, he's a very important person in my research. So to finish, um, uh, uh, there is no much time, right? So I'm sorry. And uh, in conclusion, um, I'm thinking about a balance between art and science. And uh, all, uh, all the projects and all my field work show that um, maybe another world may become possible. Yeah? Not a world of contemplation, but a world in which reading and writing will be in a certain relation of dynamic complementarity. Experimental and art with the Kintsugi, the circle description and reinscription of genetic codes of flowers, the arts and reflection of the words, and uh, bacteria, uh, reactors, hormones, human genes, and so on, um, who could become humans somehow. And uh, all this shows the, that the fatalism on Anthropocene, Anthropocene theories, um, uh, despite this, the scientists are not sleeping with the contemplation of the pale moons of the reason. And uh, just to finish on third, from my field research, um, it appears that science is do it yourself and do it yourself is science somehow. There is no substantial difference and both universities and citizen laboratories and 
uh, citizen uh, spaces and hyperspace are most doing and making science and uh, at the same time art so art is something that appears to me as uh, the main point of all of this and a balance between art and science is something uh, is the goal of all okay thank you very much thank you i'm late uh, sorry for uh, being late thank you no okay, problem like i know it's a very little time <laughs> i'm sorry about that i know it's very short time but thank you so much Jill. uh i don't know if anyone uh, i know i mean we passed like three minutes but i don't know if anyone has any qu specific questions but one maybe one very quick question for you or not no problem at all um so thank you thank you so much it was a pleasure having you having you here um thank you. we uh well natalie just said it's a lot to think about definitely it is <laughs> a lot to think about but i really liked just to mention your references you those artists are like i really admire their work the way they question these boundaries between art and science and they bring other fields like anthropology or social sciences philosophy into the discussion i mean that's just brilliant it was very inspiring thank you thank you very um much. thank you um so it's great to be here thank you everyone for participating in the bioart and design track today we were going to start the lightning talk session and uh, this session is going to be moderated by me eloisa and camila uh, and we divided our participants into two groups so the first group i'm going to be moderating then camila uh so let's go First, we are going to have Laura Margaret Ramsey. I want to read her bio here. Uh, Laura is an interdisciplinary artist and educator who works primarily in photography and computer generated art, currently res residing and maintaining a practice in Toronto, Canada. Ramsey is no known for her exploration into the intersection of the natural world and the oncoming texture of AI's potential reach. Her work is heavily influenced by the structure of the archive and is informed by the algorithmic, algorithmic approaches and data management. Thank you so much for being here today, Laura. Um, just let me make you uh, into a co-host so you can share your screen. And yeah, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Let's see. See that okay? Yeah. Great, so uh, thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate this space to share our ideas with each other. Uh, first, I'd like to not acknowledge that I live, work, and create on stolen land. Toronto, Canada occupies the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat, who are the original custodians of the land. Toronto is part of the Treaty 13 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which reminds us that we all share the same bowl and spoon, therefore we must take only what we need to allow for continued abundance and future viability. So my project is titled Herbivory, Data Sonification of a Forest Ecosystem. As an educator, I am interested in the importance and effectiveness of different comprehension strategies, Sonification is the use of non-speech audio to convey information. In the context of this artistic endeavor, the sonifications are audio representations of a plot of visual data points, which may be used to improve accessibility or a general interest in the data. In this case, specifically examples of insect and mollusk herbivory. Herbivory is the feeding on living plant parts by animals. It is a key ecosystem process that has widely recognized effects on primary production and on vegetation structure and composition. The effect of herbivory depends on herbivore feeding type and intensity. A number of methods have been used to measure the intensity and effects of herbivory. Keep in mind that different non-human animals, in this case, insects and mollusks, 
make slightly different traces that can be distinguished from each other. So, for example, while a beetle may skeletonize a leaf, a snail may leave only holes. First, I recorded many samples in the field, then ran an edge detection algorithm over each record. In the ecological sciences, some are using image processing and machine learning algorithms to aid in identification and to help map the intensity of leaf damage pattern. I am using these tools in tandem with data sonification to deliver an oral experience, which could be used to help understand herbivory patterns and used in a deep learning framework. The idea for this was birthed from a short story written by Roald Dahl titled The Sound Machine, written in 1949, wherein a man named Klausner invents a machine to translate sounds that the human being is unable to hear. His shocking discovery of a rose's screams whilst being cut leads him down a dark and disturbing journey of pain and suffering amongst plants. While Dahl insinuates that the sounds come from a, deep, a place of deep pain, these maps sing out with variable intensity and timing, a production of plant matter loss and of compensatory growth. So here is where I talk about data sonification. Cinematography uses graphical sound recording to obtain a visible image of a sound wave to realize the opposite goal, to synthesize a sound from an image. For this project, I am using a similar browser-based tool inspired by the ANS synthesizer created by Evgeny Merzin in 1937 and de further developed by Olivia Jack to synthesize sounds for my herbivory maps. These leaf maps were placed on a grid with an applied scale of notes on the y-axis, oops, forming a locational sound map. Each grid is then scanned horizontally and a note is played on the instance that a bite edge is detected. The sound is a function of the number of edges you hit as you travel across the X axis. The more edges you detect per increment along X would be a function of the intensity of herbivory. This auditory translation of the map of damage allows for a discussion on how a human compiles data versus how a computer translates it. Notice how the skeletonized leaf is a cacophony of sounds compared to the sudden blip of the internal holes of a mollusk bite. Data sonification has previously been used in astronomy studies of star creation, interpreting cluster analysis, and geoscience. The aim of this project is to help support this alternative method of experiencing complex data in a learning environment for learners of all ages. In close, I'd like to thank all the living and non-living participants of this project, and thanks to all of you for your attention. Thank you so much, Laura. I love this idea of bringing to, to our human senses what is unaudible, uh, and I love the visuals as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so next, we will have uh, Natalie Dubois Calero um, from Incubator Lab, University of Windsor, Canada. Uh, by the way, we're going to skip Heidi because she had some technical problems. So. Natalie, are you there? Oh, I don't see. I don't see Natalie in our list here. Of part okay. Yeah, she's here. I will. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Hello, Natalie. Hello. Welcome. Uh, do you want me to share your slides, or are going to, or are you going to share your screen? Um, 
I will try to share my screen if I can, or if it's taking okay. too much time, it's up. What maybe it will be shorter if you share. Okay, so should I share slides? Sorry. Oh, okay. 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 So let me do it. And first of all, I'm going to introduce you. Okay. So. Um, Natalie has one foot in art as she graduated in fine arts at BFA and one foot in science as she has a PhD in plant science. She was born in France, is a member of Milieu, the Institute for Arts, Culture and Technology and Concordia University Montreal since 2016 and of Incubator Lab at the University of Windsor from 2021, both in Canada. She works with microorganisms and her recent workshops explore the relationships between humans and their own microbiota and viruses. We consider them devils, but they are the non-human parts of ourselves. We want to impose on any creature we can not control an anthropocentric man-made nature. But what are we exactly? So with this intriguing question, I give floor to Natalie. Welcome. You have five minutes for your presentation. Yes, and uh, the question is, why do we host microalgae uh, amongst uh, a dermal a microbiota? And um, yes, nobody knows exactly. Uh, they, it, what is strange is that we are uh, wearing them for thousands of years. And um, bacteria, it's okay, but algae, why? And can you get the first image, please? Why? And um, I was, why I have done this project, it's also to communicate with the microalgae that we have in our microbiota. And in fact, there is a cyanobacteria, and mainly uh, the melanobacter, a sibling column. And that's what and melanobacter means uh, the, the, uh, the nymph of the dark water because they are growing in resurgent water, really deep water, or in gut. And uh, my problem was that those bacteria and also others uh, like uh, Paraclorella and um, Cyanophora paradoxa are said to be not cultivated or not cultivable. That's why I decided to cultivate them on myself. And for that, um, I found an easy way. And uh, I, I, I put, I have done some uh, media, one control just agar, one uh, potato dextrose agar, one uh, LB agar, I get it in, in this piece, and uh, I put it directly on my skin. Can we have the other, the next uh, slide? Yes, I put it directly on my skin and I protect them with a, a new um, um, film use in medicine and, in, uh, and to protect tattoo. In fact, it is a transparent, waterproof, adhesive, braceable film, and also wearable, as you see. And the one used for tattoo, if you're interested, it's uh, the treadmill is urban, urban gong, and the, the one for uh, medicine is the uh, hyperpix. What is great is um, this uh, film uh, can, uh, is, can um, isolate uh, my agar and my microbiota from contaminants. Can you see the other, uh, the next one? Yes, and you see, uh, because my idea was to make an, a meeting between my IG and, uh, and my microbiota with the water. 
just to have them uh, meeting and communicating and learning to, to find something about me. I started <laughs> putting my hand in water. And uh, in fact, I am like a, a petri dish. Um, and that was important for me to, to be an organism among other organisms and try to see what's happening. And that's why I, I have done exactly as we do with the tradition. I was writing on it. <laughs> and that is my, uh, and uh, I, I put those touch uh, quite everywhere on my body. And uh, that's why I have a lot of data on it. I put what I <laughs> see. And my final goal, in fact, is to integrate algae in our skin. Uh, in order to uh, to regulate uh, glucose in blood by with uh, photosynthesis, because the photosynthesis is a really usual way to regulate glucose. That, that, that's why I am in town. And the last one, yeah, because I I live um, two weeks. And with uh, my uh, transfer on me, and nothing bad happens to me. And uh, I want to do a lot. And also, I am looking for collaboration. Thank you so much, Natalie. This Not was super. This my, was my... super interesting. <laughs> we are so <laughs> used to cultivating microorganisms in petri dishes that are made out of plastic and doing these things on the lab. And I love this idea that you integrated this like a wearable device. <laughs> to... Yes, on my life. And no, I have a really sensitive skin. And the only problem that I have is with the LB um, uh, media, culture media. But in fact, what uh, my, mm -hmm. my algae, my microbiota was um, feeding on my sweat. I guess, mm -hmm. because in fact, I have exactly the same result uh, on the control or on any of the, uh, um, the culture media. Very if you fun. can, if you want to try, it's really funny. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so I guess we can go to our next speaker, Sasha Fisherman. Are you there, Sasha? Yes, you are. Great. Do you want me to share your slides or do you want me to share? Them? Are you going to share your screen? You're muted. <laughs> Cool, thank you. It wasn't letting me unmute. Um, I can request access for the remote control. Um, does that work? Yeah, okay. So now you're able to pass on the slides, right? Yeah. Cool. So first, let me read your bio. Uh, sorry for the loud noise. Um, okay. So Sasha Fisherman is a sculptor and researcher based in Los Angeles and Baltimore. She's particularly interested in marine biomaterials, toxicology and genetic engineering as points for critical analysis and me mechanisms for sculpting. She has presented her work and brand workshops at Genspace, UCLA, U Denver, CS, ULB and Caltech where she has been a leader fellow, research fellow. This past summer, she organized a community cicada shell collection and bioplastic ext extraction workshop and was a resident at the Baltimore Je Jewelry, Jewelry Center. Floor is all yours. Thank you, Sasha. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me and for organizing this. Um, so I, I'm a sculptor and um, this is a project that I did over the summer um, with the uh, Brew 10 cicadas. Um, so this is some of my work, um, as I mentioned before, I'm a sculptor and I, a lot of my practice revolves around, um, experimenting and formulating new materials and, um, a lot of the, the work that I do now came from when I was in school making all these sculptures and I, um, didn't know 
about all the toxins that were in the materials I was working with. Um, and I work a lot with resin, which is a petroleum based product. I feel like a lot of us know how bad it is for um, our bodies and for the environment to work with. And um, Biosummit has been very important to me because it was really where I found more people that were thinking outside of um, what exists right now and how um, we can work with organisms and waste products to create new materials. Um, and this is just like a slide of all the all the bad things that resin does to your body and the environment when you work with it. And it feels um, it, it's silly that I that we work with um, these materials because while they can do things that other materials can't, um, they shouldn't have to be so um, toxic to work with. And so I began working with biomaterials um, several years ago, and I've just been experimenting, trying to find an alternative to resin. And um, my favorite material that I've been working with is kytosan. And kytosan is um, a shrimp shell, crustacean shell uh, based material. It's extremely versatile. It is uh, antimicrobial. It has a high heat resistance. It's uh, really, it's super, um, it's amazing. It can be flexible or hard. And uh, this is going to be, yeah, all the different sources that kytosan can come from. So it can be from, as I mentioned, crustacean shells. You can find it in insects, lobster shells, um, mushrooms mycelium, algae, and um, a lot of uh, arthropods, basically. So when any kind of um, insect or arthropod molts, the shell that it leaves behind is made out of kytosan. And I, I knew that um, the 17-year cicadas, uh, the brew 10 cicadas, oops, okay, go back. All right, I'll just stay on this slide. Um, so the brew 10 cicadas um, were coming out last summer in Maryland. And the last time that they had been out was um, when I was in, I was maybe in like third grade or something. And I remember all of these bugs coming out of the ground and it was kind of scary, but I've, I've been um, over time really interested in kind of giving myself exposure therapy and being more integrated with um, these organisms. And uh, so I went back to Baltimore and I'm based in Los Angeles right now. So I spent um, my summer in Maryland and the cicadas just started to come out of the ground. It was so exciting. So their life cycle, they basically will, um, they, when, they're, um, when they're born, they burrow into the ground and they suck on tree roots for 17 years. And um, when they, the 17 years are up, they all come out within a span of like two weeks and they all begin to molt right away. So this is, um, you can see on the bottom left corner, the, the little um, cicada on my hand, that's one that is about to molt. So it's basically trying to find, crawl up the tree and begin to just come out of its shell. And uh, this is the molting process and it's, they will, they will do it anywhere. They'll do it on top of each other like in the most bizarre area. Some of them don't make it up onto the trees. It's really a magical thing to see. And I knew that there would be a lot of these shells left over from this molting process. And I was interested in using the shells to extract kytosan. And also knowing that I, I couldn't collect as many shells as I wanted to, working with the community and inviting them to collect the shells with me would be um, the best way to kind of uh, take this project on. So I did a community um, cicada shell collection and extraction workshop. And um, I was interested in the, these questions around like what actually happens to the cicada shells? Like, are they um, going back into the environment? Is that beneficial to the tree that they come from? Because there has to be some um, reason why they are there. So uh, these are just some photos of the workshop and all the shells everywhere. And um, it's been really interesting to to work on this because I still don't exactly know why um, they leave their shells and how that does benefit the environment, but I have read that there is more um, growth um, from the years of cicadas and that they've been finding in tree rings. And yeah, these questions of um, looking at this like distinct start and stop to um, a, a material resource and kind of looking at that on a larger time scale, I feel like it's a good um, model to understand how we can um, understand a threshold that we should extract things from.
yeah, thank you so much um, for having me. That's all for now. Thank you so much, Sasha. It's so cool that you are using Psychedus to produce biomaterials. I have a lot of them uh, in my city as well. In this particular time of the year, they all emerge from the ground and start screaming. <laughs> and it's cool to see that there is another possible utility for it. Um, great. So now our next speaker is Heidi. Just let me put on her Slack. I skipped her at the beginning. Hello, Heidi. There, thank you. Uh, I was looking how to unmute myself. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Okay, so thank first I'm you. going to it's so nice to have you here. I'm going to read uh, your bio. So um, Heidi Jock, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, sorry. Uh, Heidi is an experimental designer trained in industrial design and a director of the interdisciplinary research group Sistemas Materialis, which she founded in 2018. Her professional practice as a designer is a product of many interests she pursues passionately, craft, bio-inspired material fabrication and interdisciplinary research. Thank you so much. The floor is all yours. You have five minutes. I am not hearing her. I don't know her connection. is a bit bad, I guess. I think she lost the sign out because she's not here. Okay. Oh. Kami, so I guess we can go to your session. What do you think? And now we can start sharing your screen. And once Heidi comes back, we can yeah. do her talk. Great. Yeah. Sure. So I will share my screen. Wait a minute. I wasn't prepared. <laughs> Do you want me to share it for you? No, no, no. It's okay. No. Nice. Cool. So here we are. No, it's not. I think Heidi is Wait. back. Yeah, Heidi is Heidi's back. Heidi's back. Okay, so Heidi, are you there? Heidi can unmute. Let me send you a request. Okay. There. Can you hear me now? Great. Yeah, and I'm going. I'm to so share sorry. I don't know what happened. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Cool. So as I was saying, while the all the slides uh, pop up right there. Uh, so this is a project called Ovophilia, and it's a collaboration between me and um, Labba, which is a laboratory from Valdivia, from materials from Valdivia, in which Jose Maria Jose Besuain is currently another fellow. Uh, so I'm based in Argentina. They're based in Chile. And uh, we've connected through social media. We haven't met in person and we started this project. How can we make a collaboration uh, to construct something and to rethink materials and craft with biomaterials? So they develop a, next slide please. They develop a material uh, based on eggshells. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, they've they've been working with the material based on eggshells, um, and, on eggshells and uh, agar, uh, a mixture. Sorry, I can I, I can read it this screen. And with this material that they've been working on, we decided to see how can we uh, fabricate some objects that could uh, showcase the 
responsibilities and the properties of these materials. So what we started to work with is like, now you have already a kind of masters the materials. So how can we build some designs that are not actually the final object, but the manufacturing device in which we can transform this material. Next slide. This is the, the inspiration for this. So we wanted to make something that you could have a, a complex shape, but the, the process to get those complex shapes was not so uh, difficult. So we started looking into this installation from Isamunoguchi uh, about these pulling forces that could make really uh, complex surfaces that could attain, that could be attained by this material. Next slide. So Ophelia, uh, it's an, uh, some kind of a machine which we can print uh, different compositions, formal compositions of, uh, with this material eggshell, having a flexible membrane and a support structure where you can pull within the points that you wanted to make the shape. Next slide, please. This is uh, the first trial that we did. So this is uh, this textile structure and the pulling points could become uh, kind, of, kind of something that you could parameterize in order to have different shapes or the same shape if you would always pull with the same force and from the same point. Next slide. And this has an iterative process in which from that initial trial that we did about this uh, with this flexible structure, in here we made a frame in which we could um, figure different points to make this parametric process. It's a craft parametric process because you have the points there, but you're moving it uh, by hand and deciding it which shape you're gonna get afterwards. The interesting thing about this project, it was about the collaboration. How can we had a collaborative process when they were doing the material in Chile, I was at first in Buenos Aires and then I traveled to Berlin. Uh, and it was really an amazing thing that happened that in Berlin, there was one of the co-founders, Valentina of LABBA, and we were able to do this, uh, all these extremists in tandem in all the different uh, cities. Next slide, please. And these are some of the prototypes that uh, we built over this process. It was a kind of a short process, but everybody hands-on working. Another collaborator in this was um, Nicolas Hernandez, who helped us with all the 3D uh, structures. And the idea of this is able to build a machine that we can uh, share the, the files for you to build it. So you can make your own structures made from your uh, eggshell waste with the a recipe that has already been uh, developed by uh, LABBA, the laboratory from Valdivia. Uh, you can check out more of the last pictures, like, like the final pictures we have in the bio creation stations from the project. This is just like a teaser of it. And then you can see the different shapes that we build. So not only that we are we stretching this, but we're also designing these final or terminal parts of how the piece is going to look. And it's a really interesting material because as it recalcifies, it really resembles uh, somehow a ceramic uh, at the end. Thank you. I think that's the last one. Yeah. Thank you so much, Heidi. I love it so much. Mainly this <laughs> idea of reintegrating the materials after its usage and also the organic forms. Super cool. Thank you. Um, Great. So now Camille is going to be moderating and I'm going to be timekeeping. So Camille, feel free to share your screen. Hi, everybody. So nice projects. Oh my God. I want to talk with everybody, but <laughs> we're running out of time. So here we are with the next four one. Um, well, um, Corinne, are you there? I have to allow you to talk. Yeah. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, 
So Kareen uh, is the San Jose area artist, a STEAM educator who creates workshops that elevates and empower community voices in conversation centered on identity, science and technology. She is the program director of Sinampa Community Bio Lab and the co-founder of BioSham Camp. So very nice to have you to have you here. Um, do you want to control the slides? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'd love to control slides if you can give me a remote control. Yeah, I give. I already. Give. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the introduction. And it's so inspiring seeing all the things that people do with biomaterials. It's just so exciting. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you bio quilts. And this is an experiment in exploring how can we engage broader communities through art. Um, break, engage broader communities in the conversation about biomaterial design, sustainability design, and just being comfortable with our microbial world. Um, and so this is a project that was supposed to happen before COVID, but got extended because of um, well, for the same reasons as many of you have had projects extended for different times. Um, we weren't able to um, be in person um, until the spring. And so this project actually expressed itself in public spaces as a very first engagement for many community spaces. So um, what my goal was to engage the community in telling them about biomaterials from their own perspective, using materials and feedstock from their community. And from my lens as a bio artist and arts activist, I really believe that bio design is storytelling and slow making. And how do we do that with biology with community? And how do we design new spaces that we have these conversations? And so why even try to do quilts? This is very experimental. You're going to see the quilts we made. They don't really quite look like quilts. But um, in the United States, at least, we have quilting bees historically where people would get together and work on quilt squares. And you would help someone else and you sit together in communion. So I think quilts are familiar, um, and but the materials we have are maybe not so familiar. And so there's this interesting synergy between the two. These are images of some of the processes we had. We work with mycelium. Um, algae string and um, mold forms. This is one of the quilts that we created. I worked with three different communities. One was Little Saigon in San Jose, and um, we created a quilt based on a local artist's design, and the community brought in feedstock and um, grew the mycelium. Each community I went to, I went back for a second workshop after the materials had grown into the substrate and grown into the mesh. So we were talking about grown assembly designs, Oh yeah, um, algae string, I can show you the recipe for that, I see that in the chat. Uh, this is the one we did in Japantown and we used feedstock from um, waste stream ramen and waste stream uh, rice, uh, as well as used coffee grounds. And some of the materials from one uh, community workshop went into the next one uh, in our more Latinx community um, with veggie lucian. Um, uh, we use nopales cactus for the feedstock. Yes, we're sterilizing materials. I autoclave them, I'm not autoclave, I um, put them in a pressure cooker. Um, and so this was a process, was creating mold forms, some were laser cut and then encaustic dipped, and then people pressed their materials into that. And then the substrates were put in cooking um, canning jars and I uh, pasteurized them. Um, and this is the steps. So we used um, different types of mold forms. All the workshops took place in community spaces, community gardens, and parking lots. You know, I don't have much time. There's a little bit more on the process. Um, and people also submitted sketches for what that pattern might be that they grew the materials in. Uh, we collected ideas um, for future materials. Uh, I think I'm gonna skip this slide because I think most of you are familiar with many of the materials that um, uh, we use, but we grew mycelium that was donated um, we, our starter material was from Microworks, and then we seeded that into the materials that people brought. We worked with bacterial cellulose. Here's some um, of, of the top left is what we use, and then the other ones are past experiments that kind of inform this. And um, uh, we also use chitin, bioplastic, and all the feedstock uh, and the ingredients are uh, culturally relevant, so we didn't use um, any supplies from like Carolina Supply, we use stuff from the local community guard, uh, community stores, um, the algae string. 
um, different artists from different different communities. Each target community, um, an artist created the pattern that we use, and then I created um, different mold forms for those, vacuum formed as well as laser cut and encaustic. And then these are some of the participants in our different spaces. Um, here again, everyone making this is the most fun part. I think was making the algae string that they then embedded into their quilts pieces, and you can see some images here. Um, the different sites. Uh, Little Saigon site was really amazing because they only spoke Vietnamese um, and they were all gardeners. Um, so just really interesting working with some multi-generational com um, communities. And uh, some of the outcome was just kind of getting ideas for what other materials we could grow our quilts in. And so this is really an experiment in how we can expand conversations um, and draw upon the creativity of our communities that we, we are part of and work with. So thank you so much. I'm afraid I'm over time. Thank you. Wow. So awesome. Like all the possibilities when you work with community, like uh, it expands the possibilities of the materials and, the, and the, the, the things you can do with them. So, so nice. So well, now we have uh, Elizabeth. Are you there? I will um, now. I allow you to to talk. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm so excited to be here. This is amazing, blowing my mind, and very <laughs> grateful to be part of the conversation. Um, I would like to run my own slides too, if that's possible. Yeah, I will give you the control. I will uh, tell you a little bit your bio. Okay, so great. Elizabeth is a professor of sociology at a BMCC and faculty member in the Master of Arts and Liberal Studios at the Graduate Center, where she teaches fashion studies. She has written, spoken and published it about fashion technology and embodiment in the US and international. And her current work explores what the future holds for fashion and beauty design. So, so excited. Okay, and so now you have the control. Click to start the remote control. So if I just click, oh no, oh no, I, I'm gone. Wait, where do I click? Uh, if you go, Forward, yeah. Oh, you figure okay, out. Okay. I, I'm a little ahead. Okay, here we go. Yeah, let's go back. Nope. Oops. I'm so sorry. It's a little bit is slow. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so. my first slide is gone, but that's fine. I'll just start. So, um, and I also have to say, representing 2019 Bio Summit. Anyway, um, speaking of fashion, so um, I'm a little flustered because my first slide is not there, but I will vamp. Uh, today, I will be talking about if biodesign holds promise for solving some of the problems with fashion. And as we all know, fashion is one of the more polluting, if not the most polluting, although there seems to be some dispute about how polluting fashion is. But the fact is, there are problems with landfill and water and dye in the water and a lot of other problems that biodesign may or may not be a solution to. Um, so the question I'm here to talk about is bio, can biodesign fix fashion? Now with this sort of kombucha stiff thing, I don't know if that's going to be something that can fix the problems with fashion because I would not wear that, but maybe some of you would, but that's not something I would put on my body. Uh, so I think you all know what biodesign is. I have talked about this to audiences that don't know what biodesign is. So I have this picture of Will Myers, who you may be familiar with, um, and he's talking about biodesign being design that incorporates living organisms or draws on living organisms to um, create the design. And um, some of the problems that are coming out of that definition have been addressed by Orkan Telhan, who prefers to use the term biological design. And he is asking questions about biological design in terms of understanding the needs of other species and a design practice that is not only about humans. So he's taking, Will Myers take a little bit further away to a space where, um, yes, thank you for <laughs> citing to Will Myers and Orkan also is quite widely available in terms of his speaking about biodesign, which he's calling biological design. So um, 
That's me with Suzanne Lee and Daisy Ginsburg, some of the founding people of biodesign practice. And this work was based in uh, field work where I've gone to things like this summit and the bio fashion tech summit in uh, that the till worksheet people put on. Um, and a lot of hanging around with very interesting people who are doing biodesign, bio art, synthetic biology, et cetera. And um, this is sort of a meta thing where I'm in the picture, but I'm at a different fashion tech summit. And I actually interviewed, I was planning to interview this guy who's speaking from Caring. So the question is, biodesign has potential to fix fashion, but there are some barriers in place in terms of the cultural legacy of technological practices that biodesign is entering into. There are scientific attitudes and values that are not necessarily conducive to being um, savior of the planet, even if it is biodesign. And there are cultural legacies from fashion that are resistant to um, resistant to adopting biodesign, not only in terms of people who are um, designers, but also people who are like, why would I put something on my body that had algae on it? So there are optimists like Natsai Adre Chiesa, who's got beautiful work here, tied with algae, and um, Suzanne Lee, who I mentioned before, who's grown garments, who has grown garments from, <clears throat> excuse me, kombucha, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's a whole mushroom patrol where everybody's growing things from mycelium, and they're all very optimistic that biodesign of this sort can be made viable and not so prohibitively expensive as it is right now, and something that could be adopted by the general public. Um, there is a lot of imagery out there where you have like, the sexy woman in the mycelium grown um, leather, where uh, everyone's saying this is the way of the future, but I I have not been able to go to a store and buy something like this, so we really need to work on getting it to be more um, viably available and more purchasable. This is a collaboration with Stella McCartney and Bolt Threads where they made a tennis dress. And again, there's no way to buy that right now. Uh, and also there are some, Daisy pointed out, Daisy Ginsburg pointed out that there are some problems with thinking about the context, like people want to design things in biodesign because they can, but like the glowing trees makes a great photograph, but are people thinking about the context of that tree that may be going all the time and ruining the ecosystem that it's in. So um, in 2019, I met an amazing researcher from Buenos Aires who was saying, well, what you have to do is adopt a different mindset and think of how can we design in a way where we are not in charge, which gives me hope because the idea of the auteur and the designer is kind of this person who's like the um, master of the universe and supremacy over symbiosis. Uh, so what we really need to do is we can't hand over this biodesign revolution to a small cast of characters the way we did for digitization. We need to stay community oriented, which I'm seeing today, and um, accessibility and um, democratization in a way that digitization did not do too well with. I can share my findings with all of you when I don't have only 30 seconds left to go, um, but I'm very excited to be here in this conversation and I'm skeptical, but hopeful that we can be able to grow our own clothes and have original things and enjoy them and throw them out in a way that will not destroy the planet sometime in the near future or the future at some point. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I didn't talk too fast and time's up. Yeah, awesome. So I think it's great. Like, um, to, to, to think uh, how much time it will take to get to the future and what things are, are the ones that we have to work on uh, to get there, like cultural things. Uh, people uh, wanted to use this kind of materials and how to make technological uh, skills so we can put them in the real world. So let's hope that the future is near <laughs> so we will get to the next next talk are you here i'm here can you hear me yeah hi hello hi everyone it's uh, great to be here and amazing and really inspiring projects all around so super cool yeah, so Offer uh, is a multidisciplinary art artist working in mixed media installations and figurative sculpture. His work is informed by his practice in bonsai and driven by the fascination with process and the tension between the dynamic and the seemingly static. 
So, very interesting. Uh, I will give you the control. No, I think, I think uh, let, let's keep the control over with you and uh, your lovely, lovely cat. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Um, cool. So basically, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ofer Grunwald. Um, a multidisciplinary artist, uh, currently living and working in Jerusalem. And uh, what I'd like to sort of do is present a little bit about the work uh, and the behind the scenes that went on uh, in the development of uh, my recent exhibition, uh, My Mother's Country. Let's move forward one slide. And there we go. Um, okay, so that's a bit squashed, um, but it gives a, an idea. So uh, basically all of the works in this exhibition uh, were completely dynamic, uh, were completely continuously evolving, um, kept changing throughout the duration of the show, which went on uh, for uh, two months. Uh, what we're seeing here is one series of works out of uh, um, quite a large body of work that went on in the show. And what I'd like to do um, today is basically go a little bit into the, the behind the scenes, um, into how we developed uh, the techniques that made this show possible. And I think we need to begin. Let's move forward another slide. Uh, the project, it was uh, an international collaboration, uh, basically developed uh, between uh, myself, um, Angela Pisani, who's actually here with us uh, in the audience. So hi, Angela. Uh, from Reagent uh, Labs in Ghent, Belgium, and Professor, Professor Nir Oshirov's uh, Microbiology Lab in uh, Tel Aviv University uh, in Israel. And basically what we did was sort of set out to create a new or a novel way to create mycelial paintings um, or to basically allow us to create um, a technique that would focus, it's not sort of biomaterial focused, but certainly in a way that we were looking to use the material uh, in order to make what we needed it to do for the contemporary art. So uh, anyone who's ever done this kind of development knows that these projects have ups and downs and twists and turns. So let's move on one uh, slide. Uh, what we'll focus today is on three uh, sort of key eureka moments that we had um, in our project, in the development um, of these sort of techniques. And let's uh, move on to Eureka the First. Um, this very, very modest sort of slide, this very modest Petri dish, uh, the first Eureka moment actually came on very, very quickly, very soon, actually in the first day in the lab, where uh, the lab has its uh, calibration protocol, where they take the culture and they try it out in different concentrations and different volumes. And usually what they do is just see where they have the strongest signal, and then they just focus on that. So for them, it was just a regular calibration protocol. For me, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, hold on, this is a, a, a brush set. This is actually a tool set, which I can then use, let's move on one slide, to create a very sort of diverse range of uh, dots to create these paintings, different saturations, different uh, textures to create the effect that I want. So that was a huge sort of eureka moment for me to realize how we could take these lab protocols and use them as an artistic tool set. Let's move forward. The second eureka moment, and let's play the video, is basically when we got to this point at, at some point in the development of the project um, that we had enough control to sort of, wait, wait, okay. Uh, we had enough control to sort of create or approach um, the painting as one would video. Uh, this is supposed to be a timeless where basically we were able to reliably have enough control over the different curves of these different brushes over time to sort of um, set up an initial um, setup that then evolved in a way that's almost video-like. Let's move on to Eureka the Third. The last thing that I want to talk about is as we were scaling things up to the final size, and you can see they're quite large, we sort of realized that we could um, re-incubate the paintings or re-incubate things as we needed. And that allowed us to get to the resolution or the DPI that really took us to the next level. Let's move forward a slide to sort of create these final images. Um, forward one slide and create um, the exhibition, which here you can see, 
And again, we went very, very briefly into it in this sort of format. Uh, you can see the entire exhibition and all the various works in it in the BioCreation Station in the online gallery. And finally, I would say, let's move to the last slide. Um, again, there's a lot of details that we haven't gone into because we're doing it so briefly. So please, if you want to know specifics or techniques or materials or things like that, please do feel free to be in touch either with myself or with Angela, who's here in the crowd. And again, a huge thanks to her because without her, the project would never, ever have gotten off the ground. So thank you all very, very much. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I would like to ask you if the images are something uh, specific or... Uh, you're muted. I mean, um, yes, basically the, the, everything in that exhibition had to do uh, with my family, three generations of my family's history. Um, so the paintings that we saw uh, are actually inspired by uh, contemporary Aboriginal artists that uh, I encountered in Australia. And these paintings tell basically the, gener the, the story of my mother's country um, through three generations. Uh, and again, that's what was sort of the focus of that exhibition. So cool. Really, really, really nice. So thank, thank you. you a lot. So, Saraga, are you there? You are muted. Oh, hello, everyone. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I know I'm it's late for you. <laughs> That's okay. Yep, it's 3 a.m. over here, but we have a prayer time now, so I'm quite okay with it. Huh. Um, and I think, <laughs> I think you, uh, I'm going to be fine if you control my slides. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, so Sarah is a biology artist who loves to integrate in areas of synthetic biology, astrobiology, health science, uh, art and design, and divinity. So, time is yours. Thank you. So, hello again, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Khan speaking from Peshawar, Pakistan, and I'm going to be sharing with you a project that I've done in collaboration with uh, Joe Davis in 2020. Uh, it's a project too complex and a little deep to be described in five minutes, but I'm up for the stunt here. Uh, so, the project is Beit al Um Next slide, please. Uh, Beit al Ma'mur is an Arabic term that means the house of angels. Uh, this name is based on an actual Beit al Ma'mur said to have located in the seventh heaven, right above the Kaaba, um, uh, according to the Islamic scripts as worse in Hadith. Beit al Ma'mur is a, is, a, is a place of worship just like the Kaaba located in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, where Muslims circumambulate and perform prayer. 70,000 angels enter Beit al Ma'mur in the heaven on a daily basis, worshiping God, and then they leave without returning back to it. It's always the fresh batch that repeats the cycle. Next, please. Uh, so the project uh, had its begin beginning during the first wave of COVID-19 as a humble call to humanity. Number one, to stand together in the times of devastating pandemic, delivering the message of hope. And two, uh, overlapping the uh, disciplines that are long reputed to be separate. Our project is all about building connections between science and arts, but also between arts and mathematics uh, and science and spirituality and culture and divinity. Next slide, please. Uh, now to put more light on the scientific aspect of, of this project, I'd like to mention now uh, the, the DNA manifolds. It's a new method of storing information inside the DNA invented not so recently by Joe Davis, whom we all know as a godfather of bioart uh, affiliated with Harvard Medical School and MIT. Uh, the method uses um, cascading strategies to nest information in astronomical number, which can be elegantly aligned with a mathematically uh, with mathematically inspired repeating uh, Islamic calligraphy and geometries. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you may also think, what is it that we've chosen to store uh, store inside the DNA? Uh, well, it's an Arabic phrase said to have repeated for more than one thousand years as an invocation. Uh, so the text is Subhanallah which means glory be to Allah or hallelujah. So um, 
and there are uh, lots of other languages um, you can read if uh, there might be your uh, one of subhanAllah in your language as well. Me and Joe Davis were inspired by the two sources of the Arabic script or Hadith to be exact. Uh, one is from Sahih al-Bukhari, the other one is from Nuzat al-Jalis. Uh, both the Hadith mentions the importance of repeating subhanAllah 100 times, but causing two different effects. Uh, number one, purification of the soul by the reward of forgiveness. Number two, creation of the angel, as you can see uh, on the slide. Uh, uh, also, a little, a little uh, context, uh, too many people wonder is what do we mean by angels in Islamic perspective? Well, believing in angels is the second pillar of Islam. Yes, angels are pure and free from evilness and sins, but they're, they're no babies, no, uh, nor, nor in diapers. Uh, angels in Islam are huge and strong, and they have dominant physical presence. One of the angels in Islam, also uh, one of my favorite one, is Jibril alayhi salam. Uh, who is huge, uh, who, who has a huge size, filling the horizons between heaven and earth uh, with his not two, not four, not eight, but 600 wings. And it has been narrated that multicolored pearls and rubies fall, fall from his wings. Uh, so angels in Islam have been given powerful roles than just worshiping and obeying the Lord. They have got cosmological, psychological, spiritual, and eschatological roles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we did not use straightforward method of DNA encoding through which in, uh, information density of two binary bit, bit per base uh, can be achieved, uh, uh, which, can be, which can be done by converting subhanAllah into the Arabic language ASCII and then into the, um, uh, then the hexadecimal ASCII subhanAllah into the binary language. Um, uh, another coding scheme is utilized to convert subhanAllah binary language again into the subhanAllah DNA language. Uh, for this purpose, we assigned binary numbers to the DNA basis based on their molecular weights. Um, however, however, we followed nature's um, recursive way of keep, keeping the record of uh, stored information in layers um, as it's swivelled in the central dogma. Uh, we wanted to resonate with the intricate geometries and the overlapping calligraphies of Islamic art, holding subhanAllah in several different but simultaneous layers of informational symmetry, achieving the density of 2.8 bits per base. Uh, that's higher than the current uh, methods to date. Uh, uh, next slide, please. To create SubhanAllah Manifold, we use silent code, amino code, and numerals of, um, uh, of, D of DNA basis to create 2.5 more DNA sequence. Um, uh, these are the molecular structures of the 20, 20, uh, 258 more DNA sequence. Uh, comparing this with the straightforward method that created 76 more subhanAllah sequence is roughly three times bigger, but has 19.5 subhanAllah repeats in a single sequence, um, as the minor code, silent code, and abjad repeats um, uh, in 17.5 order. Uh, 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 do we have next slide? Uh, so in order, to, uh, in order to showcase this piece of bio artwork um, as a peaceful gesture, we used a typical pin to hold our 2.417 quintillion subhanAllah repeats, or, or the angels, in a one millimeter layer of DNA fixed with a, with a, with a fish glue. Um, in case it's troubling, troubling you uh, to calculate how big the number is, one quintillion is equal to 11 trillion books. Uh, this will take an entire population to read 13,500 uh, words each day for 30 years uh, to finish reading one, uh, 11 trillion books. Now to get the idea of how many angels can now be created, you have to, you'd have to multiply these numbers by another 1.417 uh, quintillion. Uh, using this technology to synthesize SubhanAllah and uh, creating repeats, uh, repeats of them, an astronomical number of 200 million billion uh, Joe Davis and I think we can create, we can change the demographic of heaven and maybe unite the humanity and co uh, comforting the word with the peaceful message of hope. Thank you. Whoa, beautiful. So interesting and so mathematical. <laughs> so, well, I cheer for everybody. <laughs> so nice projects. Um, Now it's supposed to, to have um, a, a video creation station uh, tour, but it, 
that won't be possible to happen because uh, the, the ones that were going to give the tour uh, are not uh, here. But uh, we invite you all to go to the BioCreation station. I will put now the link here and see all the projects. They are projects uh, of people that we're talking today and from other people also. Um, so I will leave you the link here. Yeah, yeah, Kareem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just a reminder for everyone to go to the Nuclear Zoom room for the reflections from the day session starting now at 7 um, p.m. ET. And yeah, thank you so much for participating today. It was great. <laughs>